All rise, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. And I'd like to welcome everyone on to uh, our Zoom uh, presentation here today of City Council. And of course, we'd like to start our meetings off with the singing of Old Canada. So let me introduce the pre-recorded performance. Stella, Stella Trudeau. Stella just completed her fourth year at Laurier University. She's studying music and French there. She hopes to become a teacher in the near future, and she loves the arts. She's enjoyed being a part of local musical theater productions and music festivals. Thank you, Stella, for taking the time to give us your rendition of O Canada. So we draw, it, draw everyone's attention to the screens, please. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. Quand on passe pour délivrer, il se porte la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée des plus brillants exploits. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard. Oh, Please, everyone, be seated, and thank you so much, Stella, for doing such a terrific job. That was really good. Yeah, that yeah. yeah, was fantastic. Well done. She'll make a great teacher as well. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, as we go through our agenda, the first order of business is the adoption of the minutes from our June 23rd council meeting. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Campbell. If there's no discussions, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Mr. Okay. Mayor? Yes? I'd just like it amended. 11.A um, said I abstained. I actually have a conflict of interest. I'd just like that to be noted. Okay, Miss, thank you. Mr. Clerk, did thank you get you. that? Okay, did you get that, Mr. Clerk? Yep, okay. So we're thank good. You. Okay, thank you. We're good with that. Okay. Uh, moving along, disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Uh, Councillor Lococo, uh, Cario. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, check to myself, 438077, June 3rd, 2020, for $77.26 reimbursement of expenses. Two checks payable to Niagara Falls Art Gallery. I sit on the board as a resident, 437773, May 20th, 2020, for $2,333.33. And check 438581, June 24th, 2020, for $2,333.33. And I have two conflicts on the agenda. My spouse works for the Niagara Falls Downtown BIA, 7.2 BIA budgets and 9.5 Queen Street closures. That's all. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Councillor. Councillor Cario. Thank you, Worship. Um, 9.3, um, something to do with the Vic uh, Victoria Avenue BIA wanting to close Center Street. I have property in the area, so I'm not involved in that at all. I'm declaring conflict. And there's a letter, 9.4, same issue. And also on bylaw 2020-73, use of land for temporary patios. I have one. Okay, any other disclosures? Okay, and myself, I have disclosure for two checks made out to myself. Uh, check number 437870 and 438356. And I'll hand this in to the clerk so everyone will hand in their sheets uh, to the clerk before we're done. Uh, yeah, is that good, Mr. Clerk? Yeah, okay, that's great. Thank you for that. Uh, so we'll move right into uh, mayor's reports and announcements. Uh, first off, uh, we've got some obituaries. Um, Dolores Bateman passed away, one of our city school crossing guards. 
So our condolences go out to Dolores' family. And as well, we lost Dr. Ron Murgle, longtime community veterinarian, uh, husband of June Murgle, and another sad loss in our community. Our condolences go out to both of their families. Uh, let's talk uh, briefly about mandatory masks. Uh, at the region, just to update everyone, uh, there was a motion for deferral last week, and the main problem was because the uh, bylaw that was created was created at the last minute. We didn't have enough time to really make it what it needed to be, and we'd already de uh, deliberated for several hours. So the decision was to defer it to Thursday, next Thursday, where I'm certain it's going to be, it's been amended and it's going to get passed, and I think it's a much better approach than a hodgepodge of municipal uh, bylaws from community to community. Uh, the challenge, I will say, has been, you know, people tell us to take our cues from the experts, and as you're, or as you should be aware, the Chief Medical Officer of Health for the region and the province are, neither of them are in favor of a uh, mandatory mask bylaw. And as well, they pointed out to us, the improper wearing of masks is worse than no mask at all. Dr. Urgy pointed out to us that in Kingston, the nail salon where they had that outbreak a couple of weeks ago, pretty significant, and it was in the national media, all of the staff were wearing masks. And the problem is, when you don't wash and sanitize your hands before touching a mask, you're now contaminating it, and then you put it against your face, they call it the triple threat, your eyes, nose, and mouth. And when you put it there, you're asking for trouble. So that's why last week at the regional council meeting, we did uh, vote unanimously in favor of awareness and education because the first thing people need to understand is how you wear a mask because wearing it wrong is dangerous. And then the next thing is next Thursday, we'll be dealing with this. And I've spoken with a number of regional councillors and they feel much more comfortable with where this discussion has gone and the idea that we'll have a finished bylaw that we can vote on rather than approving a bylaw and amending it later, they'd rather get it fixed and then vote on it once. So that's the status um, right now. And uh, I can tell you that public opinion has been divided. Uh, it's been, I know uh, Councillor Dabrowski had a poll. Uh, most people's polls were pretty close and it's a very um, polarizing topic with people. Uh, it's unfortunate that sometimes, and the last thing we wanna have is neighbor against neighbor, People shaming, embarrassing, judging. You know, that's the last thing we need in our community. Everyone's stressed as it is. It's been several months of being uh, in this pandemic state, and we're doing a great job. We've crushed the curve, and I think it's really important that we make sure we go together collectively, not fight each other. We don't need to circle the wagons and shoot inward. We need to make sure that we're working together because we are all in this together. We need to make good collective de uh, decisions. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Cario. Yep, yep. Your Worship, uh, for obvious reasons, it would be better for our city if there was a mass bylaw that was the same in the whole region. I think we all agree. Yeah. Um, it would be confusing if each city in our region had their own mass bylaw unless they all had the same provisions. But if for whatever reason, Your Worship, the region doesn't vote one into effect at their next meeting, I think that our council, as a council, we should be ready and have all of the information we need on hand at our next meeting to deal with the issue at this council. So if they don't deal with it next meeting, I think we should have all the information brought to us so that we could deal with it. So your worship, if it's okay to do it now, mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion that staff bring a report back to our next meeting, providing us with all the information pertinent to a bylaw making fast face coverings mandatory in public spaces so that we can discuss, debate, and decide what is best for our residents on this issue. The report should include but not be limited to things such as age and medical exemptions, all the things that you've been talking about, uh, provisions to maybe to even some cities are supplying masks uh, for people who can't afford masks, uh, an expiry, expiry date on the bylaw, uh, update from our regional and provincial health units, information on what the other municipalities are doing as far as their bylaws, especially um, our neighboring municipalities, mm -hmm. assuming the region doesn't do it. Enforcement, talk about enforcement. Your Worship, I, I don't know of anyone on our council that's opposed to a mask bylaw, but I feel that 
based on the fact that the province is dealing with this problem on a regional basis, it only makes sense that our region deal with it. Um, not looking to duck out of the issue. Like I said, if the region doesn't deal with it, I know that most people on our council want to deal with it one way or another. So that would be my motion, Your Worship. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we've got a motion second by Councillor Thompson. Do we have any discussion to the motion? Yeah, I'm gonna speak to that. Okay, Councillor. Thank you. Um, everybody knew I was bringing a motion today. It, it, it's no secret. I think I emailed everybody St. Catherine's information a couple hours ago. Um, I see absolutely zero reason to reinvent the wheel. Um, Dr. Herji was at their meeting yesterday. Um, I know that Council Lococo took detailed notes on Dr. Herji's um, responses to the questions. And I'm, I'm going to bring this up at under new business because I think we have a month to our next meeting. And this, this motion kind of stymies or is attempting to stymie the conversation that I wanted to have. So I'll re I, I'm going to vote against this motion and I'm going to raise it again under new business because I think that four weeks is too long. Um, some of the statistics I have for you, um, not are only are Dr. Herjis, but are the ones in the states that are already reversing their decisions. And some of those states had to reverse their decisions within 15 to 30 days. That's a really small window, Mr. Mayor. And I think the more we open up, the tighter our rules have to be. And I don't, and I think we have 30 days, 31 days to our next meeting. And some of these states have had to close within 15, or had to reverse their decisions within 15 days. So I don't mind, I understand Councillor Cario's mindset of nobody here is opposed, but I'd like the information put on the floor today. And I don't think we have a month to wait. So I, I, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is one, if the region passes it next week, we don't have a choice, we're locked in with the region. That's correct. So, I'm assuming, Your Worship, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but if the region passes a motion, that's the motion that's going to be enforced for the whole region. Yeah. So St. Catherine's motion becomes redundant. Mm -hmm. If we pass a motion here for masks, it would be redundant. Next Thursday, you're going to deal with it. That's why, and I'm not trying to um, stymie anyone else's motion. I just thought I had in mind to do this motion because it makes sense to wait to see what the region does. If the region doesn't put the motion into effect, we need to deal with it. So maybe the time frame. I mean, if the region doesn't deal with it, maybe we deal with it sooner. But it doesn't change the fact that I don't think we should do it until we see what the region does. Because it makes more sense to have a region-wide un um, uh, universal uh, mask bylaw than a city-by-city -city bylaw. I think everyone would agree. Okay. And, and and quite frankly, I don't think it hurts for us to have the discussion today. Um, whether you, I, I see where you're going with this, but at the end of this meeting under new business, I will be bringing up some information on that discussion then. But I'm going to vote against this motion. I think a month is too long. Um, I sat through five and a half hours, four and a half hours of a regional meeting to watch it be deferred. And I'm hoping that it's reconsidered when the new information, I don't know what new information they can give you in another uh other than enforcement, but St. Catherine's meeting last night was, I, I think, the most educational thing I've watched on it. And Dr. Herji was spectacular and answered questions um, straightforward. And the information I sent you, actually, Councillor Cario shows what the other municipalities are doing and how they're enforcing it and how they're, who they're exempting. So I'll bring this discussion up at the end rather than berate it right now. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes, I think. I think there's an easy way to deal with this. Uh, put a amendment to uh, the motion that if the region doesn't pass this on Thursday, we have a special meeting mm -hmm. of council on Tuesday to deal with the issue. We can do that. I don't. I think a month is too long, also, and I think we can overcome that by and have just the one subject and deal with it. Thank you. Okay, uh, That's yep, yeah. okay, That's okay. Yeah. Sounds good. That's Councilor right. Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have um, a lot of written notes from Dr. Herji. The Council for St. Catharines asked Dr. Herji a lot of questions yesterday, and there was a lot of very valuable information that I haven't heard put in that way before. Should I go through them now, or are we doing this under new business? But I would like to comment on the difference between 
um, a local bylaw and a regional bylaw. One of the things that Dr. Herji said was that the regional bylaw would cover the individuals because the region does not have any authority over businesses. The local bylaw would cover the businesses and that's where you would see signs in the businesses and then the businesses can say it is a local bylaw, we have to abide by it. So there is a difference between a local and a regional bylaw and I thought that was very good and um, there's a lot of information about science, scientific evidence. Should I continue with my the answers now or should I go later? Because well, I, I think it's really important. Well, are, are you going to vote in favor of the motion? No, I think it's, it's too, I think we should deal with it now. Okay, well then we've got a motion on the floor, so you have to speak to the motion or you can hold it for some other period. So do you have anything to speak to the motion? If you have questions to the motion or comments to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did want to speak about science because a lot of people are wondering why the public, regional public health officer is not mandating masks. And what Dr. Herji did say is that they need scientific evidence to do that and he's not prepared to do it, nor is any other public health officer. What he did say was that usually there's a gold standard for science, um, scientific evidence and it's random, double blind, placebo controlled science and there's no possible way that we can do those tests right now. He said there was some controlled, um, there was three cluster randomized controls 18 years ago with SARS about masks and it was with the community at large and there were three studies. Two of those benefited having masks. One of them said that masks w were of no value. So even though we keep saying that we were waiting for the public health officials to come up with scientific evidence, Dr. Herji said yesterday that we're not going to get any because it's not going to be done. So I, I do want to put that out there because I think that's very important. People are saying, well, show me the science, show me the science. So that was very important. The difference between the regional bylaw and the local bylaw, I think, is um, a lot of it is other information, not specifically on the motion for now. I'll address it later if we come under new business. Okay. Uh, Councillor Carrier. Uh, Your Worship, I'm fine with a friendly amendment made by Councillor Thompson that if the biggest issue with this motion is timing, and he's suggesting that if the region doesn't deal with it on Thursday that we reconvene on Tuesday, then that probably would, that's acceptable to me, and it probably would solve Councillor Anoni's uh, issue and some of Councillor Lococo's issue on timing. Um, maybe it's a, a bit of a time, so that would solve that problem, Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councillor. Um, through you to Councillor Cario, it would solve that, and I, I wouldn't have had a problem with that amendment, except for Councillor Lococo just explaining the region's mandate will, the region's bylaw will be able to enforce people. Our bylaw will give businesses the, the authority to say to someone, you cannot come in here without a mask. And, and I listened both to the region and to St. Catharines Council last night, and I do understand mask shaming, I do understand that we don't want to have that. I do understand there has to be an educational program, but for businesses here and for the emails, and we've gotten a number of emails just today, and the phone calls that we're getting is people want to be able to enter, and, and, and I don't know, I'm sure everybody grocery shops, but the standard thing in your head now is that person is not social distancing. I can't get through this group of people without going through people who are not six feet away um, they are not social distancing in grocery stores. You, they are not social distancing in some of the patios that are open. Um, if you can't social distance, those businesses have to be able to be, tell someone you cannot come in here without a mask. So I understand what Councilor, where Councillor Carrier is going with his motion, but it doesn't give, the regional motion does not accomplish what we want here. And that's for the ability for businesses to say, wear a mask and I'll just give you a for instance, the city of bylaw, the objective of the requirement of their bylaw is that owners and operators of indoor spaces accessible to public, to the public have a policy that requires staff and customers who are visiting to wear a face covering and they have to post signage. That's why the city of Toronto proper did it. And each one of these municipalities that are in the list that I sent you have the same codicil in it where it gives the businesses the uh, the authority to do that 
and I know that the people who are calling me, and I, I know maybe some people called everybody, they want to be able to go in, particularly seniors who are immunocompromised or over 70, want to go in and grocery shop without being, being worried. And so they're looking for us for that kind of leadership. So while I thank Councillor Cario and understand his motion, it doesn't give us the authority that we need. Uh, yes, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll make one final comment before we vote on it. If we're looking at any of the polls, we're seeing approximately 50, 50, 55, 45%. So in my mind, if I'm out there in the community, I should see about 50% of people wearing masks. That unfortunately is not happening. So as much as we've encouraged people to wear masks and as much as we've educated, it's not happening. If it was 50%, I think a lot of people would feel a lot better but I'm not seeing that and neither are the people that have emailed us. And we've received, as of two hours ago, I added up the emails that came to all of council. We had 40 emails up until about two hours ago and then there was a rush, but that 33% um, were in favor of masks and seven were not, give or take a few, maybe I missed a couple of them, but that gives you an approximate. That's 82% that were in favor of masks. Do you see 82% of the people out there wearing masks? That's my challenge, and I think we need to move ahead, um, giving the resources to the businesses. Thank you. Councillor, with all due respect, that's an organized campaign by groups. You can't use that as any kind of stati statistically significant numbers. It doesn't represent anything. It's just a group of people sending emails. That, that doesn't mean anything. All that matters, unless you have a statistically significant survey, that's all that matters. Everything else is for fun. So though our decisions have to be made on science, and Dr. Herji, we've heard him many times, he is not in favor of it because he says the science isn't there. So let's stop using science. We're gonna do it or we're not gonna do it. So the region has agreed, or, or the region is bringing it forward next Thursday, and we're gonna vote on it. So you're, either you're for it or you're against it. So if, you're, if you and Councillor Iannone are against this approach, then just vote against it. Councillor Dabrowski. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, I just like to say the province has been empowering regions across Ontario to enter phases gradually over the past couple of weeks and months. And our numbers, our, our health numbers have been reported regionally. And I, I do believe consistency is, is key in crushing the curve. And I, I think, and Councillor Iannone kind of alluded to it, reinventing the wheel. I think we'd be reinventing the wheel if we enter into a, a bylaw today municipally when the region might overrule our decision anyway. I think that's a waste of, of resources. We're only a week away from the regional vote. Our region hasn't even entered stage three yet. So although it is a topic that's timely, I agree with Councillor Thompson and Councillor Cario. I think it's in our best interest and the residents' best interest to, to plan for a what if through a, a staff report um, and then work with uh, with the regional vote next week to see if, if the region does enforce making uh, face masks mandated. And if we need to call a special meeting, which I'm confident with Zoom, obviously I'm on Zoom today for the first time, but we can call a special meeting within 24 to 48 hours and, and get us all around the table to, to revisit it if need be. But either way, I'm happy to support Councillor Cario's motion um, and support the, the second by Councillor Thompson as well. Okay, uh, Councillor Thompson. Well, I think we got uh, a good motion. Um, and if I was gonna vote for a bylaw tonight, I would want it on the agenda this is not just to put up hands and vote for mass. There's detail in there that has to be on a, by, a written bylaw for the council to approve. So I think the motion gives us the opportunity to come back on next Tuesday, uh, maybe even to uh, uh, do something to enhance our local bylaw. Uh, with the regional one. I think that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Councilor Peter Angelo, did you have a, I thought I saw your hand. Not really, Your Worship. I mean, my, my comments were gonna be along the same lines as Councilor Thompson just mentioned. I'm sure that when St. Catharines dealt with it yesterday, they had a bylaw in front of them that they could look at. They did. That's, that's, that's in essence what, um, you know, what Councilor Cario was asking for. He's asking staff to bring us back something that we can actually have a look at so that we can approve. I appreciate the point that there's a difference between individuals and businesses and maybe we're going to get to the point where, where we do pass a local bylaw and there's a regional bylaw in place. 
But before we do, I think we need to have it in our hands and be able to look at it. It's not just a matter of showing up a council and say, you know, let's enact this, and no one has a chance to read it ahead of time. So, uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, and, and to that point, you know, I was following the St. Catharines uh, Council meeting, and the bylaw just really has very little teeth in it too, as well, because they're they're calling it. Uh, a least restrictive type of bylaw. It doesn't require the business or operator to have somebody at the door who's going to challenge people coming in without a mask. It really is a voluntary compliance. So it's a, a mandatory voluntary, voluntarily bylaw. So it doesn't really make sense to me. You know what I mean? It's, it's like I'm speeding and, and oh yeah, you were speeding. Well, you know, I, I was voluntarily wanted to speed so you can't give me a, a ticket, right? But so people have the choice whether they want to, to do it or not. Um, I think children under 10, they said they don't have to wear them or if you have an illness. And you know, I, just, I would just hate someone to go in, doesn't have a, a mask and then somebody shunning them uh, on, on Facebook. So I think if we can, if the region doesn't make a choice, we come in and, and have something with a little bit more teeth than the St. Catharines Council does. You know, and ultimately, here's the discussion going on around the region. This is not enforceable. Let's be clear. The police, the bylaw, and public health are not enforcing this. So you can make anything mandatory you want. If there's no enforcement, it's, it's a suggestion. This is about the average person who's a rule follower. And if it's a rule, they're going to do it. It's not because we passed a bylaw. It's not because we've got uh, uh, shaming going on. It's because it's a rule. And a lot of people, the majority of people, I'd say 80% are rule followers. They will follow the rule. So if the region passes the bylaw, you don't need to differentiate between local, regional, business, personal. People follow them or they don't. That's why it, if we have a, a strong, acceptable bylaw that people will, ex will go for, people are going to follow it. The majority of the people are going to follow it. That's how it is. It's more of the psychology of this than anything. So let's give them something that they can rally behind instead of divide. Last thing we want to do is divide people. See who can have the hardest, toughest, meanest bylaw. That's not what it's about. It's about passing a general rule that people can follow along with. And they can be rule followers and be respectful of each other and not be shamed uh, when they make their decision about a mask. So I think we've got an excellent motion. And, and we voted or we don't vote for it. Yes, Councillor Strange. And to that point, Mr. Mayor, and if you, and if you gave it, left, left it up to municipalities to make a choice, and say, you know, nine were in favor and wanted to make this a strict bylaw and three were not, you know what's gonna happen is those three municipalities are gonna be doing their shopping and everything else in the other municipalities, and that's what we don't want. You know, it should be coming from the province, the health, or the, or the health officials, or the region. Because, you know, everything's done on stages, all done in the region. The numbers are all done by the region. So I, I think we should leave it to the region's hands. If they don't make a decision, they'll come back to us in an emergency meeting. Well, and I th agree with you 100%. That's the key because people, we go, how many people here go to Costco, right? And, and how many do that cross shopping back and forth? It happens all the time. So the key is keep it simple, keep it safe. And, and I think people are going to respect, they're going to respect the direction of, of the bylaw. So if there's no further discussion, we're going to call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed. Okay, we've got two opposed. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. So I'll continue on with my mayor's notes. COVID-19 good news update. Uh, obviously, the province has announced stage three. Niagara's not included, but not a big surprise. We were a week behind last time when we went into stage two as well. Uh, summer of the patio. This has been our staff have done an absolutely incredible job. Uh, of helping businesses open up patios. They've gone above and beyond, and I just want to tip my hat to business development, to bylaw, to engineering, planning, fire, all of our departments, uh, clerks, everybody has done legal, have done an outstanding job to help these businesses survive. And you got to understand, many of them have had no business for four months and now they've got a chance to make some money to pay some bills. And they're nervous. They're upset. People aren't working. It's a tough situation right now. So thank goodness. The other thing I want to draw your attention to the screens, um, uh, CNN 
recently uh, highlighted Crush the Curve, and I'm proud to say that started right here in Niagara Falls. It's been highlighted on CNN around the world, and I want to thank uh, uh, one of our local businesses who employed some Brock students, interns, who together came up with this idea early on in the campaign. And uh, obviously, we said early on, when people are saying plank the curve and these kind of soft words, we said, what is that? Maybe massage the curve, maybe feather the edges of the curve. And they said, no, no, crush the curve. So, <laughs> well, we can make a motion later, see if we can get some uh, endorsement money. Anyway, we're pretty, uh, pretty proud of the fact that that started. And then we had the Crush the Curve caravan that drove around, so we took ownership of it. Some people uh, made fun of it in the beginning, but uh, it turned out to be uh, pretty widely accepted. Canada Day. Thank you to uh, Lori Albanese, Works of the City, did a great job, and her team. Our virtual celebration and contest was, was a huge success, viewed by 26,000 people. People were showing their Canadiana and posting the celebrations all over the community. We had more than 200 prize winners, $10,000 of gifts and prizes. So well done, uh, the city. We had a unique year. We had a unique celebration. Uh, infrastructure announcements. We had a couple of big announcements through the federal government. Uh, Bridge Street Multimodal Transit Hub. And our staff have been working very hard along with the region to make sure that our multimodal transportation hubs are coming together. And this is going to, at the Bridge Street Station, it's going to fully integrate transit inside and outside of the city. It's an entrance point for hundreds of thousands of people right in our downtown. They're going to be building new bus platforms, parking, ground transportation facilities, station enhancements, and technology solutions. There's $3.2 million contribution from both the provincial and the federal governments. And as well, $10 million portage and drum and road reconstruction. I don't know if anyone else has gotten complaints about drum and road and portage road near Five Corners. Well, just south uh, of Five Corners is the direction. We're going to be doing underground rehabilitation first. It's going to allow us to lay down fiber for Niagara Regional Broadband. We're going to enhance the safety for motorists and pedestrians. We're going to do sidewalks curbs, uh, roadways, the whole area is going to be made nice, and bike lanes. And I know uh, that's one of our directives of councils, any new roads we put in bike lanes. And eventually, we'll be a fully functional, bike-friendly city. These projects are going to help uh, with uh, the jobs necessary as part of the COVID recovery. They're good signs for continued transit and infrastructure growth in the city. And our next council meeting will be Tuesday, August the 11th at 1 p.m. That ends the announcements. So uh, we'll now move into the presentations and reports. And our, f our first item, PBD 2020-37, I'd ask our city clerk if he, or I'm sorry, um, is that the one for you to, who's doing this one, Mr. Clerk? Uh, we do have staff uh, on, Alex? on standby here via Zoom, uh, Peggy Boyle and uh, uh, Brian Dick from our planning department, and I see they've got the presentation up on the screen okay, now. We'll great. let them take that away. So, so who's going to uh, introduce this? Will it be uh, Alex? Uh, I believe we have Peggy Boyle. Peggy? Okay. So there's a, there is a recommendation. It's Development Housing Monitoring Report. Council, the recommendation, and then you'll consider this as Peggy presents this, that Council receive the Development Housing Monitoring Report, which reviews the status of development and growth management activity in the city for the year of 2019. So Peggy, uh, are you there? I, I am here, yes I am. Okay, great, the floor is yours. Oh, wonderful. Okay, good afternoon. Um, we're here today to give you highlights of the development housing, development and housing monitoring report. Um, we'll speak of five different areas. There, we'll speak to these five different areas. Um, population trends in the city, all types of building permits issued during 2019, real estate market trends in the city, and looking forward land supply and residential intensification in the city. The first slide I'm, I'm speaking to here is the population trends. This slide shows the changing population over 10 years and projected forward to 2041. The last official population count was the 2016 census population that showed 88,071 people. This is an increase of 6.1% from our 2011 population figure of 82,997. 
Over the same period, the Niagara region saw a 3.8% increase. Stats Canada projected the city's 2019 population would be 95,570. Through the region's growth strategy, the city's population is projected to grow to 125,720 by the year 2041, and is represented by the last bar in the chart on the right side. The population growth is attributed to international and intra-provincial migration and not, not natural increase. The next slide is on building permits and historically 60% of all residential building permits are for single detached units represented by the blue bar in the chart. But building permits tend to fluctuate as was seen in 2019 where 67% of permits were issued for single detached homes, 26% for townhouses, 5% for semi-detached units and just 2% for apartments. The more pronounced fluctuation occurred in 2018 where single detached dwellings only represented 30% of the permits issued and apartment units accounted for 44% of the building permits. As planners, we're always striving for a greater mix in housing in order to better provide housing for all. And finally, a, a housing starts and completions are another way to track housing in the city. A housing start is usually recorded when the first building permit is issued for a construction of a unit. A completion is recorded when the final occupancy permit is issued. Important to keep in mind is that a housing start could be recorded in one year and not be completed for six months to a year following that. Housing starts increased 77% in 2019. This could have been a result of increased housing costs in the GTA, drawing people to Niagara Falls in pursuit of less expensive housing. Diminished housing completions in 2019 were reflective of decreased housing starts in 2018. It is presumed that housing completions in 2020 will increase based on an increase of housing starts in 2019. I now turn this over to my colleague, Brian Beck. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, we'll move on to uh, the other side of build. Uh, the other side of the uh, building permit uh, equation is industrial, institutional, and commercial construction, otherwise known as ICI. So in 2019, the total value of ICI construction in the city was $143 million, which is a 348% increase in the 2018 value of only $32 million. Driving that increase was the new Falls View uh, Casino Entertainment Center with a an approximate construction value of over $130 million. Overall, the total value of all new construction in the city for 2019 was $214 million. Commercial construction representing the largest portion at 64% followed by new residential construction at 3%. Looking at the real estate market, uh, 2019 was a strong year for continued uh, residential real estate market in Niagara Falls. Average sales increasing in value uh, about 8.3% from an estimated value of, in 2018 of 395,000 to approximately the average sale of a, of a house or any kind of residential unit in the city to about 432,000 in 2019. Uh, if you look at the chart, the most dramatic increase in average sale values was in the period 25, from 2015 to 2017, when the average sale value went from $264,000 to $391,000, a 48% increase in value. With respect to the rental market, uh, in 2019, the rental market uh, was very tight in the city of Niagara Falls as the, as the vacancy rate decreased uh, to 0.7% from 3.8% of 2018. 3% uh, is considered to be a healthy uh, rental vacancy rate. Across the St. Catharines Niagara CMA, the vacancy rate remained unchanged at 2.3%. As the vacancy rate has decreased, the rental vacancy rate, average rents have now increased from an average of $960 per month in 2018 to $1,003 per month for rental accommodation. Looking towards the city's land supply, uh, in the short term, the city has a 
approximately 2,400 units of draft approved and registered units, which is a, approximately a 5.2 year supply of immediately available land for residential development. A uh, 5.2 year supply exceeds the provincial and the city's official plan target of having a minimum supply of three years of immediately developable uh, land. Longer term, bigger picture, there are approximately 379 hectares of employment lands for future employment purposes and 234 hectares for future residential purposes. And this is broken down in the chart by location with respect to greenfield and built area. Uh, finally, turning towards intensification. Intensification is defined as all development activity within the built boundary. Uh, the city has an intensification target of 40% and this target has only been achieved once from the graph in the year 2018. In general, though, these intensification performance in the last five or six years has been trending upwards. New provincial and regional policy will require that this target will need to be revised upwards in the short future. Uh, just overall, though, the city will, um, the city's uh, intensification performance will naturally improve. Just if, for example, in 2019, uh, Council approved uh, 880 new residential units within the built boundary. So if these are built, we will see more, uh, better performance with uh, intensity. Uh, but overall, the changing demo demographic profile of the city in combination with the unsustainable cost of uh, urban sprawl will dictate that more growth in the future will be, need to be directed towards the built boundary. This will make the city more healthy livable and sustainable for residents. Uh, thank you so much. This concludes our presentation. Uh, plenty of staff are available for any questions. Do we have any questions of council for staff on the report? Okay, seeing none, then we will call for a motion to receive the, the report. Uh, moved by Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Uh, now we move on to the planning portion of our agenda. And I would ask our clerk if he would please introduce the next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit a three story, 18 unit apartment building at 7639 Watson Street. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on June 12th, 2020, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting. Thank you very much. Now I'd ask our director of planning, Mr. Hurlovich, to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you, Your Worship. The, um, this property is the, up. Oh, let me get to the beginning of the slideshow. Um, so the property is located on the north side of Watson Street, uh, immediately west of uh, Montrose, and uh, right at the, basically the terminus of the 420 uh, highway where it meets with uh, with Montrose, so immediately west of that intersection. The property in question is highlighted in red, so immediately to the east is a four-story apartment building. Beyond that, on the opposite side of Montrose Road, is uh, Canada Lafarge concrete, as well as regional um, um, recycling plant, as well as some in industrial uses and some residential uses on Wanless. To the uh, west and to the south of the property are um, single detached dwellings. You can see in the bottom of the screen the image of what is proposed. It's a, um, a three-story apartment building with 18 units uh, and a pitched uh, roof. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the site plan for the property uh, as submitted and was circulated to the residents, uh, shows the driveway to the property on the east of east side of the property, parking at the back of the building, 
building itself is shown in orange and the landscaping area is shown in green. The uh, applicant is requesting a change in zoning from an R1 zone to the R5B zone. They're looking for a change in building height from 10 meters to 12.5 meters. This is to accommodate the pitched roof you saw a minute ago. They're, they also initially requested a westerly side yard of 5.8 meters. The uh, R5B zone requires that the side yards be one half of the building height. And since they're asking for 12.5 meters in building height, the uh, one half of that would be uh, a little over six meters. So it's a difference of uh, about 4.5 meters, about a foot and a half. Um, they're also asking for a reduction in the landscaped open space um, that was uh, proposed for this property. So instead of 35%, they were proposing 30.25%. Um, again, just as I've outlined, they're looking for a zone change from R1C to the R5B zone, as well as uh, special provisions for height, your side yard and landscaping. Uh, we did hold a neighborhood meeting via Zoom uh, in June. There were three neighbors who attended. Since that time, uh, well, we at the time of the writing report, we had seven written submissions. I've now seen 11. I believe those are all included in your council uh, package. And certainly if any more come along, they will be added to our list of input. All of the concerns seem to range around the same list of uh, topics, and that is an introduction of higher density into a residential area, the loss of trees and privacy, that site plan issues such as parking and uh, parking space setbacks. Uh, they're concerned about on-site drainage, snow storage in the winter, concerned about noise from air conditioning units, uh, concerned about lighting, landscaping and property maintenance, the traffic impacts on the uh, intersection of Watson Street, Montrose and Highway 420, and the impacts on uh, property values. Uh, the applicant's agent responded to uh, most of those, uh, citing that drainage, lighting, and parking will all be controlled through the uh, site plan approval process. They are intending to retain one of the large trees at the southwest corner of the property and to add pyramidal oaks or cedars to create a buffer along the westerly side in addition to the closed board fence. Um, the design of the building shows a pitched roof and this was done to complement the residential character of the neighborhood uh, rather than having a flat roof. And the layout of the units was done with um, only two units per floor facing the west and that only one of those uh, units per floor has a balcony. The air, air conditioning units will be internal with a limit of three vents on the west side of, of the building. Um, the picture on the right shows the site as it looks today. It's a story and a half uh, house on a large lot. Um, the uh, proposal represents intensification of an underutilized parcel within the city's built boundary. And it does add to the housing options uh, that become available within the city. And in this case, in within the area of detached dwellings. The official plan designates the land residential there are a number of policies that uh, need to be met, which means compliance. There's a gradation of height uh, that's required. And this building uh, is three stories. The building to the west is four stories. I believe the building to the, or sorry, the building to the east is four stories, and the building to the west is two stories. So it does form a gradation in height. The uh, front yard setback for this building is similar to the dwellings found on Watson Street. Watson Street is a collector road where densities of 50 to 75 units per hectare are allowed. This project has a density of 70.4 units per hectare. And uh, due to the proximity of industry uh, on the east side of Montrose, I pointed those out earlier, uh, there is a requirement that central air conditioning and acoustical installation, insulation be installed. And the, it was also found that the ground vibration from the railway operations was below provincial guidelines. Uh, when we looked at the zoning bylaw, it is R1C uh, zone now, which permits only detached dwellings. They're requesting an R5B uh, density zone. 
and they're asking for some site-specific provisions. The building height right now is limited to 10 meters. They would like 12.5 meters. Uh, so that's a, a um, difference between 41 feet that they would like and 32 feet, which is currently allowed. Uh, they could build a, a three-story building with a flat roof, but they believe a peaked roof design is more compatible with the neighborhood. The westerly side yard, uh, they're asking for 5.8 meters, whereas 6.25 meters is required. Um, we we'll just point out that in the current zoning, a 1.2 meter side yard would, would be permitted for a 10 meter tall uh, dwelling. It would be a detached dwelling, but you could build a house of that size. The um, uh, As well, the uh, design of the building for a flat roof, the proposed pitch roof would mean an increase uh, in the side yard of 1.5 feet. The landscaping, um, as I pointed out, they're asking for 30.25%, whereas 35% is required. However, they did make some revisions to the site plan to increase the overall landscaping uh, to a 3.4 meters side yard on the west side. That increases the overall landscaping to 36.5. Uh, in order to accomplish that, uh, they are seeking, or staff is recommending, they didn't ask for this, staff is recommending that uh, instead of 1.4 spaces uh, per dwelling unit, uh, which totals 25, that they be allowed to have 1.25 spaces per unit, which totals 23 spaces. And this is uh, a 10% reduction, which the city has accepted elsewhere for multifamily development. So overall, the architects submitted a new plan which shows these increases. He was able to actually move the building a little bit further east so he can achieve the 6.05 meter setback uh, for the height of the building. Uh, the overall landscaping has increased to 36.5% and he has provided a 3.4 meter uh, landscape strip along the west side. So the uh, landscaping has been increased. The parking ratio would be reduced to 1.25 percent the uh so in conclusion staff is uh, supporting this development the zone change does comply with provincial policy complies with the official plan in terms of intensification density and efficient use of land and infrastructure the reduction in parking requirements would result in an increase in landscaping and buffering of the adjacent residential development and it does perform or provide an alternative form of housing for residents in the city. Therefore, staff is recommending that council approve the zoning amendment to rezone 7639 Watson Street to an R5B zone to permit a three story, 18 unit apartment building as subject to the regulations outlined in this report. Those are the highlights. Thank you very much, Mr. Hurlovich. Do we have any questions of Mr. Hurlovich of Council? Okay, so looks like we don't. Members of the public, you're advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal dismissing any referral it receives. Failure to notify the City Clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone other than the applicant who wishes to address Council? Uh, yes, we do have a few and before we get to the first one, I'll just read off the owner, or sorry, the order. Uh, first, we'll have Patrick Maloney. He'll be speaking on behalf of a few of the residents in the area. Uh, then we do have listed Anna Gagliardi uh, and then Jason Prop. Uh, so if uh, Patrick is uh, standing by, uh, you go ahead, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council and staff. Uh, I don't see myself on the, uh, on the screen, but I'll just continue perhaps with my submissions in any event. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to this matter. I have been asked to speak on behalf of a number of neighbors that oppose this development. Uh, in particular, our clients are those that are in, uh, that immediately abut the subject lands on the west and north side 
Uh, each of these neighbors live within a detached dwelling along Watson Street and Hodgson Avenue. They each share a backyard or a side yard with the subject lands. I would suggest to you that those, these persons are not, um, excuse me, those, these persons are the most impacted by this proposed development. Um, I want to preface my comments and make it very clear that our clients are not opposed to all development on the subject lands and would be supportive of some form of development, but they are opposed to the current proposal. In terms of uh, my presentation, I'd like to just comment on provincial policy and, and the city's official plan policies and then move to a couple of, uh, of specific issues that uh, our clients have with the development. In terms of uh, provincial policy and, and local official plan policies, I completely understand the need for infill and intensification on the subject lands, uh, in particular in urban areas within the city. However, that doesn't mean you can just throw out some similar policies that consider the impact the intensification will have on the existing neighborhood. And in my view, there must be a proper balance. So to conclude that all proposals for intensification be approved without consideration onto the impact on the adjacent neighborhood would not be consistent with or nor in conformity with the applicable planning policies. So for example, the city's official plan suggests that any new housing form are to be of a height massing and provide setbacks that are in character with the surrounding neighborhood. This proposal does not do that. The proposal actually increases the height significantly when compared to the adjacent neighborhood. The proposal represents a large massing of building in close proximity to the lot lines and to the rear yards and side yards of our clients' properties. Uh, I would agree that this lot would be considered underutilized. However, in that regard, our clients recognize that this lot could be developed for more compatible use as opposed to a three-story apartment building with an additional 2.5 meters of increased height. Uh, and as I said, our clients are not opposed to some form of intensification on the site, but are strongly opposed to the development proposed in this application. In our client's view, they're trying to squeeze, or the applicant is trying to squeeze an over-intense development on a lot where it is inappropriate. In terms of some of the uh, sites or the specific concerns, um, the use of itself as an apartment building, uh, the current zoning only allows a single detached dwelling, which is consistent with the existing neighborhood. Uh, you're likely familiar with the neighborhood. I, I did a tour of it. Almost all of the dwellings are one story or one and a half story bungalows. The proposal to introduce a three story apartment building with an increased height permission, adding an additional 2.5 meters is, uh, you know, if this is approved, there will be an apartment building essentially built right in the backyards or the side yards of their uh, properties. Um, and the, that three-story building, three-story apartment building, is taller than what would normally be, be permitted. So, in our client's view, this is is not acceptable. Uh, now, in relation to the height, um, there represents some overlooked privacy and buffering issues. With the building being much higher and closer to the lot line, it creates a number of issues associated with overlook and privacy. Uh, to be honest, I don't accept that the additional height requirement to 2.5 meters is for design purposes. This is not the first building to be constructed with a pitched roof. Uh, 2.5 meters is a significant amount. It's almost the equivalent to an extra story. Uh, regardless of design, the overall height will be significantly taller than what the zoning permits and what is in the neighborhood. Now the neighbors will see this huge massing of a building in their backyard. And I think the very reason you have a 10 meter requirement in this particular uh, apartment use zone is, uh, that is to recognize that the adjacent area likely isn't as tall uh, otherwise, the applicant likely should have sought a zoning that would allow the increased height. Uh, in terms of overlook, the side, or, um, I, I acknowledge that the side yard setback uh, has been changed um, because of a reduction in parking, but that then brings associated problems with uh, parking and traffic that I'll, I'll get to in a moment. Um, I would submit that the uh, the height requirement is, uh, is 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 too tall and not in consistency with the uh, the neighbor. Uh, the neighboring property. Um, I would also add that there are no restrictions on balconies uh, that would ameliorate this concern. Uh, there would be overlook into the backyards, to the pools, to the amenity areas that where there is some sort of expectation of privacy. Um, in terms of a second issue, or another issue is the over intensification of the site. Uh, in this case, the proposal takes us from a density of 20 units per hectare in the existing neighborhood to a density that is almost four times that. That is an objective comparison and shows the significant change in density and incompatibility of the proposed development. Um, the, the other issue uh, relates to traffic and parking. 
this is a significant concern of the neighborhood. Watson Street is essentially an extension of highway, the, the Highway 420 exit. Cars exit the highway at high rates of speed. If they get a green light at Montrose Road, they're still traveling at a good uh, kilometer. Uh, Watson Street is also used, as you know, from as a bit of a bypass to Lundy's Lane or to yeah. the western part of the city, whether it's Kayla or Beaver Dams. Uh, that results in a lot of traffic in both directions. And I understand that sometimes the traffic from Watson turning north onto Montrose is, is backed up to this property. Now, I'm not a traffic engineer, but with new, 38 new bedrooms being added to the site, the proposed development could add many more trips in the morning and, and evening uh, than is what is set out in the uh, planning report. Uh, that was uh, from comments from traffic and then the comments from the applicant's agent. Uh, the other concern relates to parking on Hodgson Avenue. Uh, there will be, as I said, 38 bedroom units added, uh, but only 23 spaces now provided for residents and visitors. With the reduction of the parking requirement, the overflow would naturally go on to Hodgson Avenue. Um, so it is our client's view that the development will create an unsafe situation, a, a situation that should be reviewed by an actual traffic engineer uh, that could result in things like traffic, traffic calming measures or justification for the reduced parking. Um, in conclusion, it is clear that the neighbours do not accept the proposed development. I act for only four of them, but there are, were other submissions from a, a number of other uh, neighbours with reasonable concerns related to the, to the development. Um, again, I want to be clear that we're, our clients are not opposed to all developments. Uh, we are, they are generally development friendly, but this development is entirely out of keeping with the neighborhood and a more compatible development is possible. So in that regard, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council, I would ask that council refuse the application uh, before you. Uh, subject to any questions, those are all my submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Maloney. Uh, does anyone of council have a question for Mr. Maloney? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Oh, well, we didn't see you, but we heard you, so thanks very much. Sorry. No problem. Okay, next up, I guess we have Anna Gagliardi, uh, who's going to address council next. Anna, are you there? Mr. Mayor, it's Patrick again. I don't, uh, she told me this morning she had registered as a delegation, but that she likely wouldn't attend uh, to speak. Okay, all right, thank you very much for that. Okay, okay, and she was on mute anyway, I'm told. Okay, so next I understand we have Jason Prop. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Proppy? Yes, yeah. yes, do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you, and how do you say your last name? Uh, Prop. Prop, okay, great. All right, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you uh, everybody uh, for the opportunity. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, um, uh, and I think I speak for a lot of the residents that abut or closely abut um, the uh, proposed um, property. Um, and I think a lot of my concerns, um, first of all, I want to stress how, um, how important I think these concerns are and how um, concerned we all are about this property itself and the impact on the surrounding properties for all of the reasons that Patrick mentioned uh, just a moment ago. And I have uh, a few more that I don't think were really talked too much about. Um, privacy obviously is a huge concern. Light pollution, I think, is going to impact uh, the properties, particularly around the parking areas, which is where my property uh, primarily will um, kind of be close to. I'm at 5276 Hodgson Avenue, which is the property that is one past the north uh, side of uh, the proposed property. So I don't uh, directly abut against it, but I'm only uh, about 50 feet away from it. Um, I would think my primary concern, um, particularly for my property, is that uh, I believe mine is the lowest in the group or block surrounding this property and I already have a great deal of difficulty dealing with drainage. Um, of course I have a drain basin at the front of my property and I do have some form of drainage from the back of my property, albeit very small, to get to that uh, basin and I'm very concerned that the addition of snow removal in the parking areas uh, probably being piled up at the back and whatnot and the, the melt in the spring particularly or on warmer days in the winter uh, are going to create literally uh, you know a, a huge drainage concern um, 
because I know it will kind of drain to my property and pool in my property. I'm very concerned about flooding uh, into my, you know, dwelling um, and for the flooding to impact my property in general and the ones around it. Um, uh, so that's my primary concern. Uh, again, I mentioned lighting at the rear of the park, you know, with the parking at the rear of the property and the fact that people will be driving in and driving out literally almost right in our backyards. Um, so both from a privacy, um, a vision privacy standpoint and a noise pollution standpoint and the smell and the fumes. Um, I'm not sure where the garbage disposal will be um, uh, located and stored until garbage trucks and recycling trucks come to take that away. Um, regardless, I'm, um, I'm concerned about the noise and smells uh, for when they do come to take those garbage away. And um, so those are some of the other concerns I have. Um, I don't think there's enough space for parking. So going back to what Patrick mentioned, you know, with overflow parking, regardless of if bylaws are put in place with no parking signs on Hodgson, I just know that 100% the natural area for people to come and visit and park and create more traffic will be on our street. Um, uh, he mentioned the distance between Montrose and QEW and the, the, the high rate of traffic already and the speed of traffic. So that's a, a concern of, of ours. And um, the last thing I want to mention is um, Historically, uh, of course, our properties are very close to the train tracks and um, historically, you know, young people and some other folks have uh, used our properties to kind of cut across, um, you know, from Montrose to the Watson area as a shortcut or vice versa down Hodgson uh, through the train tracks to get to, you know, the shoppers drug mart area or whatnot. What not. There are some fences that prevent that now and we haven't had an issue for a while, but I feel that the addition of this proposed unit uh, with 38 bedrooms and 18 units and um, you know, the additional uh, residents will introduce, reintroduce this, um, this issue um, that has impacted our properties, both from a mischief and uh, you know, uh, graffiti whatever case it may be damage on our properties you know um, that sort of thing impacting our properties again because there's no real fence between us and the the train tracks or or whatnot so i feel that that would reimpose this uh this issue that has been a an issue in the past so uh, that along with the other uh, residences issues uh, i would strongly oppose this uh, particular uh, plan um, as Patrick mentioned, I think all of the uh, residents feel that, you know, it's not, um, it's not, we're not opposed to some sort of um, rezoning or, or a different pro uh, prospect for this property. Uh, but I don't feel this unit um, is in any way, shape or form uh, a good uh, zoning prospect for the families and residents around it. It doesn't match our homes being all one or one and a half stories. It doesn't, um, it doesn't flow with the neighborhood. I think it will um, be loud and um, unsafe for the neighborhood for all the reasons we've mentioned. And um, I think something maybe uh, like maybe a, a low dwelling townhouse type setup along the west side of the property with small backyards along that property at an appropriate height with small parking spots along the east side of the property and not a gathering of parking at the rear or the north side of the property might be somewhat of a better type of setup i mean i don't think i do agree that the, maybe this property can be better utilized but the way that's being proposed is uh, severely impactful on the the residents around it in a very intruding way in every shape or form so again i'm highly opposed to this to this project thank you very much uh, mr prop any questions of counsel for mr prop okay thank you very much counsel 
We'll uh, now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. So is that Mr. Lesdow? Yeah, it's Peter. Okay. Hello, Peter. Uh, I don't know if we see you. Are you on the screen? No. no? Okay. That's all right. <laughs> okay, we're going to hear you then. That's fine. That's fine. Um, uh, I haven't seen anyone in a long time, so um, I wish everybody well. Um, this is a redevelopment that when we look at it, it makes a lot of sense that it takes a, an underutilized site uh, with a single family residence and provides for this uh, apartment building uh, a use that's, that's needed in our city. And one of the comments that keeps uh, going back of how does this fit in with the residential nature of the prop of, of the of the neighborhood or the area, it, it has to be clearly understood that uh, one, there's a four story flat roof 60 unit apartment building that sits right beside it uh, to the east. There's also a vacant lot that's along Montrose Road, which more than likely will be a commercial development. And it also must be understood that this, this particular apartment building um, is on the very, very edge of that, uh, of that um, uh, neighborhood. It, it, it's basically right along the uh, commercial corridor of, of Montrose Road. So uh, when one looks at it in that light, um, it's, it's appreciated that there are neighbors to the west side that, uh, that have concerns for their, their, their privacy and uh, the scale and size of this development. But when one looks at it, it must be understood that the design, the way it was developed, it was, it was designed within city bylaw standards. Um, the buildings set back, uh, the buffer landscape area between, um, uh, between the building and, and the side yards and where the rear yards meet uh, the west neighbor uh, have, have been maintained. Uh, we, we, we took special um, effort to, to see that those things be maintained in, in, in the process of, of this rezoning application. Um, I'll, I'll read, I, I did provide a letter um, last uh, Thursday, Thursday or Friday, um, that that did 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 address um, privacy, and that that was one of our concerns when we developed the design for this particular project. Um, and in it, um, and in it, we state this from from the very beginning in the development of the site design, the privacy of the neighbors to the west along Hodgson Avenue was an important consideration. This final site design provides a driveway entrance and exit placed along the east side of the site, along the existing Montrose Road, four-story apartment parking lot and vacant corner lot. This was deliberately done out of concern for the rest westerly prop property privacy, property owner's privacy. This arrangement allowed for the tenant vehicular traffic in and out of the site away from the west neighbor's backyards, buffered further by the apartment building itself uh, garbage pickup and garbage enclosure was strategically located on the east side of this site. Um, and by, by, by the arrangement that we made, we were able to retain uh, several mature trees on the west side of the site. We also, in this process, re revised our, our site plan to provide the, the, um, the landscape buffer between the, the building and the west neighbor's backyards, which meet the City of Niagara Falls uh, bylaw standard for an R5 uh, C zone. Uh, this, re this revised site removed the requ our requested uh, minimal variance originally requested, which was a small, probably about a foot that we were requiring. Um, included with the six meter landscape buffer is a 3.35 meter landscape buffer as discussed. Um, what we did was we, when we were at the neighborhood um, or at the public meeting, um, there was concern of the parking lot in the rear and uh, a landscape buffer strip, uh, which we only had as, at, at 0.6 meters or two feet, uh, that, that it wasn't considered enough. So we, we took that and, uh, and the city had recommended or suggested, why, why don't we take out two parking spaces and provide a, uh, a 3.5 meter landscape buffer along that rear parking lot that abuts the west neighbors um, and, um, and, 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 you know, uh, just make a variance to the uh, parking requirements. Uh, in addition to these wide landscape areas, um, in that discussion, there will be a, a eight foot high closed board fence to provide further privacy, a continuous row of cedars to 
to be planted along the west lot line, which can grow over up to 20 feet or 6.6 .6 meters, um, and, and will provide an attractive substantial screening between the properties. Um, it should also be noted uh, further consideration was given towards privacy of the West neighbors backyards with respect to the apartment buildings design. I don't think it was clearly um, in, in planning's presentation uh, made clear. The building's floor plan was developed with only two balconies. That's only two out of the 18 units facing the West neighbors properties. Um, with all the measures, I mean, we, we make every standard that the city has. Um, we went above and beyond um, providing further landscaping uh, a buffer to the people uh, on the west. Um, and there's little else in, in any design that we could do to, to satisfy their concerns. With respect to the building height, yes, we can, as, as um, Mr. Herlovic had pointed out, we can put a flat roof, three-story building there uh, and meet the current bylaws. Our intent is not to make the building higher, as was implied. Uh, 2.4 meters, you can't get two extra stories. That's approximately eight feet high. And when you have a roof pitch that, you know, when you have a building that's basically its depth is about 60 feet deep and you do a four and 12 slope, you'll, you'll get to a height of about eight feet at its, at its peak. And that's the only reason we're, we're asking for this, uh, for this, uh, um, you know, for your consideration on this variance for the building's height is because we do want to introduce that uh, pitched roof so that it is more in keeping with the residential uh, nature of the, of the neighborhood, as opposed to the four-story flat roof building that's, uh, that's beside the property uh, currently. Um, we did make a, an effort, and you could see in the rendering, to, to give the, the building a, a residential uh, a look to it, as opposed to a more commercial flat roof type of structure. Um, you know, other concerns like with traffic, I can I can talk about that briefly. When we were in the pre-consultation meeting, um, the region or the city brought up any issues uh, of traffic or a traffic study would be needed. I mean, the reality is we have a very small uh, project that has 18 units. And, um, and I know the reason why they do it, because I see, you know, traffic studies all the time. When you have, you know, that many units, the, the idea is that nobody is going to be moving in and out. All 18 residents are going to be moving in and out at the same time. They'll be moving out at different times. Like some people, uh, if you're a senior, they would be coming out, uh, you know, maybe every few days. A, a person that may be working, a father may be, uh, you know, leaving at six o'clock and coming home at uh, three o'clock from work. There, there could be tenants that don't even have a car and dependent on the uh, the public transit, which is just just close by, so at any time there may be you know one or two. If, if, if even if you had five cars move in and out of the, out of the site at once, it wouldn't affect uh, impact the many many cars that go um, along Montrose Road and um, and Watson Street. So um, neither did uh, in in the pre-consultation meeting did the region or the city uh, engineering or, or traffic. Traffic departments had any comments on the position of the driveway or its location or any potential thing of anything being uh, dangerous. So, I think some of the concerns are, um, uh, are just not fully understanding the the, the full impact of a of a development would have um, in an instance like this. That it is it, it sounds you know it's 18 added units you're adding into the area, but in the reality of the of of the size of the area, it's a very, very small intervention, and it makes, and it makes a lot of sense to to utilize this site uh, accordingly for the reasons I gave. Um, is there any questions? Do we have any questions? Yes, uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Peter, could you expand on your comment that there's only two balconies on the west side overlooking the neighbors' yeah. backyards? Two. Uh, we, what we, we, I wrote in this letter I wrote, what we strategically did was we faced all the units towards Watson Street and towards um, the rear parking lot. And so what, what happens is you get these middle units. So the building is three stories. So the middle units, there's three units in the middle, like if you can visualize that. Those are the three units. That have uh, uh, um, you know that have exposure to the west side, but the ground floor unit. I mean, there, we have an eight-foot-high fence there, so the 
core unit doesn't have any exposure whatsoever to the to the west neighbors. Uh, we do have the two balconies that uh, that are facing the west. But the proposal to um, and it would take time. The proposal to make and, and is willing to do this to grow um, either a pyramidal oak along the, the lot line or uh, or a row of, uh, of cedars along the lot line would completely um, obscure or obstruct any uh, visual uh, contact between those those two uh, balconies and the uh, rear rear um, rear yards of the neighbors' properties. It would appear from the majority of uh, correspondence I've got. Most mm. people were concerned about their loss of privacy. Would the, develop, would the developer be willing to remove those balconies that back onto those properties as, so, part, as part of moving forward and, and, and pleasing some people? I, it, it, in terms of the efficiency and, uh, and uh, development, um, it would be, it, 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 you'd be, you'd be, losing or it wouldn't be possible to do that not with the with with the geometry of the floor plan layout i mean it's 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 a pretty big effort to say okay i got two units that out of 18 units which is you know a, maybe about 10 percent a little over 10 percent to say okay that those are the ones that are are facing the neighbors um you know west neighbors properties um but if we built a two-story house beside it, and you know somebody looks out their window, um, they're going to see into that neighbor's property. It's not an uncommon thing in urban areas where you know people have visuals into other people's backyards. I don't think anybody's going to be you know. Um, I, it's just a. a unfortunate it's not unfortunate but it's just the fact that the geometry when you lay out an apartment building is you are going to get units that follow along a corridor and you're going to find units that are somewhere in the middle that face uh, a certain direction um, if you were to eliminate it the efficiency of the floor plan would be um, would be greatly compromised um, I'm not I'm not asking about changing the floor floor plan plan I'm simply suggesting that those two balconies, if they weren't built as balconies, would mm -hmm. really appease a lot of the com complaints that I've been receiving. I, I understand your question. I'm sorry I didn't understand before because I thought I did a good job of laying out the building and saying you only had two balconies. Um, I, I have uh, Guy Pellegrino right here, and uh, I could ask him that question. Uh, you know, if he would consider not changing the the the, the layout, but uh, but uh, eliminating balconies on those units. Um, if, if he's amenable to that idea. Yeah. Guy? Well, his position is, is, is he saying, you know, the balcony, which is, which is only used, you know, some parts of the year, that there would be a living room window that would still face towards the backyards, and he doesn't think that, um, the objective of, of having privacy from the unit would be um, would be achieved, but just by the elimination of the balcony. So, um, in that case, he says no. That's unfortunate. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah. Um, now that we got Mr. Pellegrino on uh, online as well, just is are they gearing towards a certain kind of demographic uh, for this building? Yeah. Yes, he's gearing it towards seniors. Uh, the building has a, an elevator in it, and um, oh, you have an elevator, even even though it's a three-story, you have an elevator. Yes, it does have an elevator wow. in, it, so it okay. can, it can uh, accommodate uh, seniors, and and the, and the building makes sense. There there could be, uh, you know, a couple in the area that are empty nesters or want to downsize, want to stay in the area, and and this uh, provides an alternate. Uh, um, accommodation or lifestyle that they could have by just moving down the street into one of the units um, if they wanted to. Thank you. Are you good with that? Any other questions of Council? Yes, Council Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Just some of the concerns that have come up, uh, I, I might have missed it, but were the neighbors uh, invited at all to be part of the site plan process? Mr. Lesdow? 
Um, yeah, the, everybody. We had a we had a, um, a let's call it a neighborhood meeting or public meeting. Um, we we discussed all the ideas that I expressed to you today uh, with respect to a privacy, uh, such as like the garbage being located on the other side of the site um, by the parking lot of the other apartment building, um, the landscape buffers that were proposed, the um, the, the, the row of planting uh, with the cedars or pyramidal oaks that were proposed, the eight foot uh, high uh, closed board fence, the um, the amount of landscape buffer that meets the current bylaw standards. Uh, the, we didn't talk about the um, the buffer of landscaping between their their properties and the parking lot, but that was a through that suggestion we we are uh, prepared uh, to do that so that uh, there is a, um, a buffer that's provided that that would meet all standards and uh, that go beyond what 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 city of Niagara Falls bylaws would require. Um, so does that answer the question? Your Worship? Yep, Councillor? Yeah, I, I, I guess I was talking, uh, I guess through you to Mr. Lesdow more in terms of uh, the site plan process. Typically when there's concerns, that's around whether it be uh, landscaping, yeah, lighting, no. uh, location of garbage. There's a, there's, a site, there's a site plan that planning needs to approve. And a lot of times the neighbors are brought in to uh, be part of those decisions of, you know, where no. the garbage receptacle is, is located, uh, the different types of uh, landscaping or, 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 or buffering that is used. So that's my only comment really, Your Worship, is I think the neighbors should be brought in to be part of the site plan uh, and, process. And our position, our position, that's fair to do that. Um, as, as I said, like, like things that you mentioned, like in the site plan process, a lot of their concerns are being addressed. Like one of the ones was a uh, parking lot lighting. I mean, in the site plan process, uh, there will be an electrical engineer. He will, um, you know, do a design of all the fixture types and their mounting heights, et cetera. And uh, with the uh, computer, uh, computer aided design, he's able to calculate lighting levels throughout the site and uh, in the city in the final design, which will be reviewed by, uh, by, by staff, um, they will see that, uh, you know, in that particular case, that lighting that may spill onto the other properties, that it, that it, that it is actually, a, they'll have a net zero that goes around it. Uh, things like uh, drainage, which was one of the big concerns. Um, I mean, a civil engineer will prepare a, a, a grading plan, uh, do a stormwater management plan on this. Uh, none of the water will be graded or drained onto any other uh, neighbor's properties. I mean, that, that, that's understood. And uh, the design is such that, again, it will be reviewed by uh, engineering staff to see that it meets you know, city standards and, uh, and that it doesn't do those things uh, with respect to the neighbors. Um, other, other issues. Um, that, that that would be if, if there is a traffic issue or so, like there was a mention of a sidewalk and the safety of pedestrians. If the traffic uh, uh, department looks at it and, and they, you know, in their opinion, feel that uh, a sidewalk is necessary along Watson Street, um, the owner will will be asked to provide one uh, to municipal standards that runs his property. So um, things uh, we had some some comment about the sanitary sores that you know will will be this project impacted again it will be you know engineered and reviewed by the engineering department so a lot of uh, uh, concerns that were brought up in this process will be really uh, addressed in in real detail in the site plan agreement stage and yes we welcome the neighbors in that stage uh, to come uh, things like like the garbage uh, location um, you know we addressed it at the zoning stage where where the best position should be for this particular for for, for the garbage where it should be um but in the in the uh, site plan agreement stage you know things like well how is the garbage enclosure going to be enclosed you know is is there going to be landscaping around the, the garbage enclosure? those minute details will be addressed at that stage um which which address uh, all of the concerns what uh, what the neighbors have on the west side with respect to their privacy did i did i uh yeah your worship i guess i just wanted to hear that uh, uh you know the planner was amenable to obviously uh having the residents included in the site plan process i always think it's a good thing uh, especially when you have concerns of neighbors uh, that deal with different things such as landscaping buffering lighting 
garbage location, things of that nature. So, I mean, if that gets added to the, uh, if that gets added to the uh, recommendation, I think it would be beneficial. Thank you for that, Councillor. Uh, just before I get to you, Councillor, um, and Mr. Lesdow too, I'm not sure if you're following in the chat, in the uh, Zoom chat. Um, there are a number of questions there too, so I just, I see some people have been leaving questions, but, but just to give you time, but Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To Mr. Ledzo or um, Mr. Pellegrino, if you were to design this based on what is allowable right now, what would it look like? We understand that um, you did a sloped roof to fit into the neighborhood, but you could go down to a flat roof. If you had to change the um, side yard um, and the landscaping, how many units would it be? How many parking spaces would it be if you had to go with what is currently there? Well, what it was currently there, it's, 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 a, it's an R1 zone, which means it's only a single family home can go on that site currently. That's, that's what you're allowed. So um, as has been mentioned several times, it's taken this oversized site, which is basically a little over a half acre and, uh, and, and, and using it more efficiently uh, to provide for, um, for this apartment building. And, and by doing that, in terms of infrastructure, you use the city's infrastructure more efficiently. Um, I mean, the site is a good location for families or, or for residents because it's close to um, existing uh, transit, it's close to existing commercial um, amenities that are in the area. So um, it's, it's just a smart project to do. Through the mayor to the speaker again, I understand that it was a single family, but there's still, we're looking at amending extra building height and um, side yard and landscaping. So if you stayed within those that we weren't amending those, what would the building look like? We're not, we're not amending those. You, you, you're miss we, in the, in the zoning process, our office, and I want to really make this clear, we, we've done uh, what we think is, 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 is a reasonable uh, effort to address uh, privacy. We're not asking for landscaping to be uh, reduced. We actually have more landscaping than what the bylaw requires now. We have 36, it was 35%. Um, in, terms of the building, in terms of the building setback, we're not requesting any building setbacks uh, on this particular design. It conforms to all the um, R5B uh, zoning uh, setback requirements. Um, in terms of the building height, um, that, that's one of the things which we consider minor and which we never had really issue when we've requested it before. What we want is, is we, can, we can provide a three-story building with a flat roof. But by providing a peaked roof, it's more in keeping with the residential nature. And, and to allow us to do that, we need, we need your uh, consideration and, and approval to allow us to, to provide that. Um, in terms of, uh, there, there's only two minor things we're asking in this application. One is the roof height. And the other one is that we reduce the parking by two. And the reason we're reducing the parking is to address the neighborhood's concern of a landscape buffer along the rear parking lot on their properties. We can comply to the bylaw. We can provide those two spaces back, but we're, we're asking them to take them out so that that added landscape can be, can be added and, and provide that additional buffer for them. So you've got 11 foot buffer. You've got a lot of landscaping that can go there that can be uh, reviewed and, and looked at during the site plan agreement stage that there is a proper screening or, or more than adequate screening between the parking lot and their properties. Um, so those are the only two things, the building height for the reason, uh, the residential nature, we, we wanna create that. And two, we wanna create that landscape buffer for the neighbors there's no other other requirements we're asking uh, in this uh, in this application okay thank you um one of my other concerns um the height and the parking and i've been talking about parking issues with a lot of our development because we're finding as as much as we say that people are using transit we do have cars and then there's other issues with parked uh, vehicles on streets so i am concerned about the parking and um, I'm a great advocate that this is for seniors and it's rental. A lot of times we've been finding uh, the developments to be um, condos. So I, I do 
I do, do give you kudos for that, but I'm just having some issues with all of the concerns that the residents are having, the height and the parking. And I'm also concerned about the traffic coming from the 420 going straight through to Watson at a high speed. So th those are some of my concerns and I'll listen to see if any of those uh, satisfy me. Thank you. Going back to the, to the, um, the, the parking, and the parking and the standards that set up, um, you know, they're, they're calculated so it, it considers visitors parking. And uh, if we were to take, and, and it's really interesting, Niagara Falls has a very high standard, 1.4. Um, it's the highest standard in the region. I mean, Niagara on the Lake is one to one. Uh, Welland is one to one. St. Catharines is one to, to, to one, or one to 2.5. Exactly what we're asking. We're asking for the exact same standard that St. Catharines would ask. And from our understanding, there have been other developments in the city which have been um, you know, supported and approved uh, using a parking standard of 1 to 1 1.25, which, which is what we're suggesting today. So um, if, we're seeing, if we have an apartment building that's geared towards seniors, and what I was mentioning before is, is many will have like one car per couple, or there'll be, I mean, there are one bedroom units in this. There'll be people that'll be single. Um, the, the parking standard, from my experience, and it's extensive, uh, is, is a standard that, uh, that will, I, you'll never see any parking on the, on the street in this, in this instance. It's just not going to happen. Any further? I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hey, thank you. Any other questions of council? Uh, so, Mr. Lesdow, uh, have you had a chance to look at some of the questions in the Zoom chat? Um, yeah, we, there weren't any questions. Um, okay, maybe you don't see them. Uh, so, I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the questions was, what's the height? You mentioned cedars. They're asking, what height cedars are you suggesting? Well, the, you, can, you can buy them in, in, in between six to eight feet. They grow rapidly and they grow to 20 feet, actually 24 feet. They grow quite quickly. So that, that would, I you know, think that would answer that question. So um, how long? It will take time for them to grow. To plant l larger cedars, there's always the risk that uh, they could potentially die um, as opposed to being something that high. But our office we planted a lot between the six to eight foot uh, height. Okay, uh, another question was uh, lighting and uh, lighting up people's backyards. So, and mm -hmm. I know a lot of this will be dealt with at site plan, but they're just questions that some of the uh, people live nearby are just concerned that maybe just as well get some kind of a uh, answer to them. I'll make that, that clear again. Um, I, I wrote something in this uh, letter that I wrote uh, on it. Um, the issue of parking lot lighting and light spilling into neighboring properties is addressed at the site plan agreement stage of any project. The city of Niagara Falls will request an electrical engineer to prepare a photometric site plan drawing, which will show all exterior light fixtures illuminating the parking lot, specify all light fixtures to be used and their installation height. With this information, computer software calculates all lighting levels around the site with adjustments to the placement wattage and shrouds of the light fixtures. When I say shrouds, that means like a cover on one side of the light fixture so light doesn't spill to the other side. Uh, the engineer must provide a net zero light level at the perimeter of the site. This process mandated and reviewed by the city will address the neighbor's concerns. Okay, thank you for that. I think those are the, the main ones. Do we have any other questions of council for Mr. Lesdow? Okay. So we will move on. The public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, Your Worship, I just wanted to ask, uh, perhaps through you to Mr. Billado, if he can hear me. Uh, Mr. Billado, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, um, so a couple of meetings ago, Your Worship, I know I, I rose and, 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 and spoke about uh, portable speed signs. Um, and, uh, and I asked that, uh, that uh, transportation staff look internally to see whether or not they had enough money in this year's budget without approving more money so that they could purchase a couple portable speed signs. Um, the very first area that these portable speed signs were, 
were to go in, were going to be Watson Street. And I just wanted Mr. Billito to uh, perhaps talk about it for a moment because I know that in the letters that we received, uh, traffic is a concern. Um, and I think it's, you know, aside from this development, but it also, it's important that the, that the residents realize that, you know, City Hall is um, uh, looking to implement something that is going to hopefully uh, calm the traffic there. So I'll leave it up to Mr. Billado to comment, Your Worship. Is, is, can you guys hear me too? This is Jason Prop, one of the residents. Yes. I, yes, we can. Okay, I, I, sorry, it sounded like you were gonna conclude this topic. No, and, no, um, no we're, I, do you want questions answered, Mr. Billado, to answer your questions? Uh, I, I, well, was, I was hoping just from a yeah. traffic perspective, Your Worship. Why don't we uh, just, uh, just Mr. Prob, just before we get to you, maybe we can just get Mr. Billado to answer the address the question of Councillor Peter Angelo, and then if you like, you can uh, you can ask your question right after. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Billado. Yes, of course. So regarding the speed in this section, the city did comprehensive studies here last year during the summer, and the speed coming off the highway going uh, west along Watson Street was around 53 kilometers per hour. That was the average operating speed. So it's not excessive. Uh, with that being said though, uh, as it means to educate motorists in that area, uh, like Councillor Peter Angelo had noted, we will be purchasing some variable message signs out there that will inform drivers of their operating speed and will provide an indication when they're traveling above the posted speed. Uh, these are portable devices that will likely be rotating throughout the city and they'll be installed at any one location for approximately two weeks time and then they'll be moved to another location in the city but this is definitely a good device that'll help uh, educate and support the speed at which drivers should be driving and just further to that mr billado would you mind talking about the data collection because i understand that these signs are able to collect data as well so i know that the city did do some uh testing way back a couple of years ago, but putting these signs out there are, are going to, um, I guess, provide us with uh, uh, more data, more current data. And also, um, in the past, typically, any, uh, any speed assessments that we've done have run usually about three days. Um, these signs, my understanding is they go out for anywhere from, is it six to 10 days? Um, so there's quite a lot more data that will get collected uh, this time around than was collected last time. Yes, as an added benefit, these signs do collect speed data and they'll be downloaded and uh, reviewed by staff after they're uh, pulled out of service for the two week duration. And if there are speeding observations that are higher than our standard and thresholds, uh, it will be pursued further through our speed control policy and involvement and uh, coordination with the Niagara Regional Police. Okay, okay. thank you for that. Mr. Prop, the mic is yours. Yes, thank you. Just to comment on the average speed of 53 kilometers coming off of the 420 into Watson, I need to note that that is a stoplight, which would, to me, would calculate that a 53 kilometer an hour average would be half of the time people coming from a stoplight at about 25 kilometers an hour through that, and then the other half probably speeding by through at about 75 kilometers an hour. So the addition of these speed monitor signs would, I'm sure, capture that and, uh, and bring light to that situation. So I think that would be extremely important. Um, now, I just had a couple notes about when we were talking uh, with the applicant about the privacy. And I don't know if anybody caught this, but every single question uh, that I heard anyway uh, was addressing the west side of the building. Now again, my property is very close to abutting to the north side of the property, and my neighbor's, whose does abut to the north side of the property, his pool is literally about four feet away from the north westerly side of the property. Of course, our properties are all pretty open, if any of you have looked at them. Uh, my pool is about 20 feet away from his, and we keep talking about privacy on the west, I'm not sure what we've talked about to address privacy on the north, which is in our backyards. Um, so similar to the westerly concerns and you know adding landscaping buffers and everything else, I'm not sure what's been done to address the north side. And I, I heard you talk about lighting. 
Uh, I heard you talk about drainage, but I'm still, I haven't heard anything talked about or addressing the noise coming from the 11 parking spots uh, on the north side of the property and surrounding parking spots, the garbage disposable disposal, which is still located closer to the rear uh, of this property, closer to ours and the noise that comes with that and the smell. Um, so these are things I've heard an answer to. Actually, on the contrary, I've heard the applicant state very clearly that in the planning process, it was deliberately made so that most of the um, residents in the layouts, windows and balconies and everything would be directed to both the front of the building, so the south side on Watson Street and the north side of the building, essentially looking out over the parking lot and right into our properties. So again, I, I have only heard partial answers to privacy issues and I think um, it sounds like we're doing a very good job of, of not addressing the ones coming from the north side of the property. And of course, there's three residents that is, you know, adjacent to the north side of this property with fairly open big yards that we, you know, utilize and enjoy and enjoy our privacy and quietness and, and everything else. Sure, there is an apartment building behind us, which is quite enough already at this point to tell you the truth. So um, I'd like to hear those points addressed um the other thing is um i'd like to get an opinion on what kind of roof is cheaper to build a sloped or flat roof because i'm not sure whose um whose concerns they're addressing with the sloped roof and asking for that and i'm not a professional so i don't know is it uh, is it is it to appease their design and their their cost or budget restraints to put a slope or a, a sloped roof, or is that cheaper to build than a flat roof? Mr. Lesdow, did you want to address that? Um, yes, the north side. Um, what what occurs there is Mr. Prop's property is is extremely deep. Um, where he talks about his swimming pool and where his backyard yard that he actually uses is really not on the north side, but on the west side. Of, of the uh, apartment's property. And his swimming pool will be basically completely screened from those cedars that are proposed. Um, the idea of, of putting more landscaping or cedars along the uh, north uh, side, that's possible to do also if, uh, if, if, if he has privacy concerns uh, for his property, which um, it's hard to explain with words, but his property is, how long is this, how deep is this property? How much? It's like 375 feet deep. 271-ish. Five feet deep, yeah. So the part where his house house is on um, is, is basically on the, you know, the Hodgson side street um, and then there's a then he has like a big open grass area. Um, from from our perception, we didn't know or see how he would use that. He keeps it very nice. It's it, it's 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 kept green. But but the activity of of his use of his property, when I look at it from the from the aerial photograph, it's uh, it's on the west side, uh, the side that we made the attempt to to create the privacy that uh, that we discussed in this uh, presentation. Um, the other properties there, um, they're also very, very deep, but they're, um, you know, on the other side of Mr. Prop's property and there's fences that go along the property. So, um, in this case, on the north side, we have a fence, um, we have a landscape strip and we can introduce, uh, the same cedar planting to go along that, uh, landscape strip as was proposed on the west side. And that would, uh, create all the privacy that uh, Mr. Prop has concern for. Oh, and the question of the slope roof, which one is more expensive? Debate either way. Uh, generally a slope roof uh, from our experience um, because of its type of structure, it's, it's really the, um, the asphalt shingles. Uh, they show themselves to be uh, more cost effective. So in our experience, a sloped roof, like a residential one we're proposing, is generally more cost effective, but not by much. 
um, that wasn't the reason why we wanted a slope roof. Um, we wanted the sloped roof um, because it, it is more in keeping with the residential character. I don't understand, uh, you know, if, it, if it's passed, uh, why people would not want to have a sloped roof uh, on the building. Um, it, it's a much more attractive solution than a, than a flat roof, um, regardless of the cost one way or the other. We're, we're not doing any sleight of hand or doing anything underhanded here by suggesting a slope roof because we're going to save some money or a few thousand dollars uh, it's it's because um it's because it's a more attractive building i mean our office uh, went to the extent of preparing a, a digital um, computer rendering of it it's that's exactly the way the building will look when it's finished um and uh, i think we've done a good job uh, when you consider uh, the apartment building that, that's on the east side of this, the flat roof split block uh, building, um, which is, in our opinion, not, not that attractive uh, building like what we're proposing. In the residential design, you'll notice the, um, the building facades. We introduce stone uh, along the bottom. Um, we have a nice uh, stucco details that will um, infill where the windows are. We have a, a large freeze band at the cornice of the roof. It, uh, it just it complements the way the roof transition goes from the main body of the building to, to the roof itself. And, uh, and, and the notion of having the slope with the, with the residential type shingle on it makes to us more sense uh, than, uh, than, than the flat roof. Um, as I said, we can, we can conform to the bylaw, take out the flat roof, or make it a flat roof. Uh, we can add two parking spaces if that's a major concern, but it, it takes away two things. One, the character and nature of the design for the, for the higher roof. And it also uh, will um, eliminate that landscape buffer that Mr. Prop uh, is, is concerned about on the west side. So those, those are the reasons why we're doing it. It's, it's because of the nature of the neighborhood and because of our concern that we want to create um, more buffer, better privacy for the neighbors to the west side. Thank you for that, Mr. Lesdow. Okay. Do we have any other questions of council? Okay, seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. What's the wish of council? Councilor Strange. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move the recommendation with the friendly amendment of Councilor Peter Angelos. Okay. Okay, so we need a seconder then. You gonna second that, Councillor? Sure. Okay. And uh, did you wanna just speak that friendly amendment for uh, the clerk then, uh, Councillor Peter Angel? Well, Your Worship, the, uh, the friendly amendment would just be that the residents uh, that have concerns are invited in the site plan process and that they become, you know, part of the discussion around uh, items such as where the garbage is located, uh, landscaping, lighting, buffering, planting, all the items that are, uh, uh, drainage was another one, all the items that are, I guess, uh, found as far as part of the site plan. Okay. Do we have any questions to the motion? Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councillor? Uh, I'm just, I'm going to vote opposed to the motion. I think the development is totally out of character for that neighborhood. A single family homes i think it's too big and it's too intrusive for that area and that's pretty much the messages that are coming across from the residents and for those that have contacted me so i'm going to vote opposed thank you for that any other discussions of council okay we'll call the vote all those in favor okay opposed okay yeah so that passed okay thank you for that So you okay? I think someone's not muted. Oh, we're good? Okay. Okay, uh, we go to reports. Waste management levy. Uh, the motion is that we receive the report. It's from the region. It's in, re okay, moved by Councillor Campbell. Seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. Did you want to speak to a Councillor? Yeah, hey, Your Worship, I don't mind receiving the report. I guess, um, you know, my question would be, uh, I guess, along the lines of the legalities of uh, charging for a service that people don't receive, 
and, and what they do in other municipalities. And I don't know whether or not staff have the answer to uh, both or either one of those, but those would be the two questions that, that come to mind uh, because of the report. Um, and, and I mean, I think that this was an issue that was brought forward by Mr. Berlin because um, a lot of people uh, end up getting charged for the service, but they can't actually uh, use the service. So those would be the two questions that I have, just in terms of the, muni the municipality charging a fee for, for a service that uh, someone can't get. And then, and then two, uh, what do other municipalities do? I mean, if we're following what every other municipality in Ontario is doing, then obviously there's, you know, there's something right about it. But if we're off on our own path, um, that's something that I'd like to know. So. Okay, uh, so who would answer? Uh, okay, Ms. Clark, could, did you hear that question? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you fine. Okay, so through you, Mr. Mayor, it is our understanding um, that this is how it's done it in most other municipalities. Um, Niagara on the Lake does do a user pay system, but you don't get to opt out. Um, you, if there's a building on your property, you pay. It's just more of a flat rate system than based on assessment. Um, they don't like that system. It's very manual to implement. Uh, Assessment-based um, levying is, is the most common thing. And then I just wanted to touch on, Councillor Peter Angelo mentioned something about them not being allowed to use the service. It's my understanding that, that they everybody is eligible to use it they choose not to because it doesn't meet their needs so i'm not i'm not positive on that but it's been my understanding that everybody is eligible but it doesn't meet their needs so they're choosing to get a, an additional service in place. okay councillor yep okay thank you for that councillor lococo thank you mr mayor i would like to receive the report but i wonder if we can go to the region to ask these questions because that's where this is stemming from we can't really do anything on our end but could the region? Yeah, uh, so now how would that, Mr. CAO, how would you suggest we, uh, if we want to get answers from the region, uh, how would you suggest we redirect this report? Well, Mr. Mayor, we could just simply uh, receive the report and refer to the region, and uh, the clerk could include in that correspondence to the region just a couple of questions that the councillors have raised, asking that they, you know, respond to those questions. That'd be the simplest way. Okay. So the mover and the seconder are uh, good with that? Yeah? Okay, so then there's no further questions or comments. We'll call the vote all those in favor. Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Okay, item 7.2. Um, so there's two options here for approval of amendments of BIA budgets. Option one, yeah, I'll get right to you, Councillor. Uh, option one, some BIAs feel that once a budget is approved by the council, they should be afraid, they should be free to do their own amendments as long as they stay within the approved budget amount. And option two is uh, once we approve the budget, that's it. There should be nothing changed without coming to council. That's the two options. Councillor Thompson. Yes, I was uh, surprised to see this uh, uh, sent by Sue Mingle who is manager of the Falls View BIA. Um, probably she has more experience and knowledge because she is also uh, the chairman of the Ontario BIA Association. So she came up with this idea. She didn't discuss it with me as the chairman and I just look at it and I think number one is appropriate and I would move that motion. I don't think we have to be involved if the budget doesn't change. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I feel the same as you do. Leave it to the BIA, do with their own budget. So motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, uh, that we go with option one uh, of the recommendations. Do we have any other discussions? Uh, Councillor Con Conflict. Right, I'm sorry, with a, a conflict with Councillor Lococo. If we have no further discussions, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Item 7.3, uh, we've got a declare surplus of lands, secondary walking path into Corwin Park. So move. Okay, yep, and we've got Councillor Peter Angelo, and then yeah, Councillor. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'd be happy to, um, 
to move the motion. I just want to make a, one minor amendment. I know that it says in the report that the purchaser shall pay for the closure of the fencing at the park perimeter. Uh, we're talking about five feet here, but typically this is something that's negotiated when you're selling the property. So perhaps that part only can be held off uh, until such time that we receive an offer from someone to actually purchase the land. And that would be the motion that I would make, Your Worship. Yeah, okay, so moved by Councilor Peter Angel, seconded by Councilor Thompson. Do we have discussion to the motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Item 7.4, there's been a couple of requests for deferral of this one. Uh, yes, I've got Councilor Alacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to speak before it got deferred. A, a few residents have contacted me with the concern that if we defer it to the fall and then we start the process, that could take a while and then we're into the winter months and then people might be stuck to find storage for their vehicles and it might take a while. I, I was wondering how long it would take once we brought it back to the fall in order to do it before it got deferred. Okay, so maybe we can get that answer from uh, staff. Mr. Hurlovich. what's the turnaround time uh, once this comes back, once council decides to deliberate, make a decision, what's the turnaround time? Well, the recommendation in the report was that we add uh, an opportunity for people to load and unload their vehicles in their driveway for a period of uh, two weeks a year. Um, so that's the only amendment we're proposing. It still needs to be advertised with the uh, public. So we need to publish that in the newspaper because it would affect the whole of the city. We still need to hold a meeting with anybody who wanted to comment. So we're still talking probably close to four months to process a simple amendment like that. I'm sure, what was that last part? I didn't quite hear four months, did you say? Four, four months to process. Okay, Councillor Coco. I would move that we um, accept the, the recommendation from staff. Uh, okay, so we've got other people that have been waiting to speak at uh, Councillor, yes, Councillor Strange. I'll actually second that when uh, time comes. Um, just, this has been going on for a couple of years and there's been a couple of residents that have these big fifth wheel trailers right beside them in their, their front uh, driveway and next door and they can't even see when they're backing out. So I think this is more of a liability issue as well. So they're there all year round. They can't even put up a fence, a 48 inch fence, but they can have, they have to sit it and watch as this fifth wheeler is about 10 feet tall and they can't even see when they're backing up out of their driveway. So, you know, it, some of these places don't have sidewalks. They back out, they get in an accident or, or hit a child playing or something like that. So. I, I would like to, to second the motion because I'd, I'd like to get on with this. It's been a couple of years and I think it's time for us to, to move on with this bylaw. Okay, so, uh, so you've heard the motion in the second. And the one thing, you know, we did get some comments from some people and I think they're relevant to at least consider the fact that right now during COVID, some people are utilizing these for family members that are isolating. Also people that travel to the United States in their trailers are not able to do so right now and they've been on standby wondering what's gonna happen. Um, also the fact that a lot of people are away right now that would have valuable input into this. So I think it's just important that we get all get it right because it's been hanging out there for a while. And I agree, especially when I see situations, some you know uh, resident has, can't see out their kitchen uh, because someone's got this big wall parked there. And that I 100% agree with. At the same time, I know in my neighborhood, we've got some people that will put it in their, their driveway just before they go away, they fill up the water, they charge things up. They clean it, make sure everything's working. Some people will let their kids sleep in it for maybe a week in the driveway. It's a big treat in the driveway and that kind of stuff. I know in my neighborhood, I'm good with it. We've done it before uh, ourselves. I think it's more when people store them for long periods, they never move, they block your view, they encumber your uh, property and you lose the quiet enjoyment of, of your yard. And that's a big challenge. And I'm glad that um, uh, Mr. Hurlovich has added in the two week period and hopefully that would address the majority of situations uh, that we're talking about. Councillor Strange. Yeah, and, and exactly. I know it's, it's during COVID and, and they're packed, you know, they, they have to park it somewhere, right? And um, they normally wouldn't store it until probably in the winter months. Um, so, you know, if, if, what, what is the date we're looking at? Is, is there a certain date or a certain time that we're gonna give them until to do? Mr. Hurlovich, do you have an idea around uh, 
a guesstimate when um, when this might take take place? Well, it's still going to take take the four months. So let's say council approves the report today. We have to notify the public. We have to do that for minimum of 20 days, although we usually give 30 days, then we'd have to hold the public meeting, then we'd have to uh, bring the bylaw back at the following meeting. Um, and then there's a 20 day appeal period for anybody who wishes to object to that. And so altogether, we're still looking at three and a half or four months. So it takes us into the fall, definitely. Yes, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I'm of the opinion as well that I, I think it's time that we need to move on with this. Um, I mean, delaying it until the fall, I, I, I don't think would be the responsible uh, way to proceed. Um, you know, just from a safety standpoint, and I know it's been mentioned a number of times, you know, we really, uh, we have our own bylaws in place in terms of fence sizes, and we don't let someone build higher than a four foot fence. So we really shouldn't be letting people park these vehicles there that are 10 feet uh, or so high. Um, so, I mean, I, I think delaying it is just gonna delay the inevitable. So I, I think if we move it now, you know, it's gonna take some time to come into effect, but it's the right thing to do. Okay, thank you for that. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councillor. I, I agree with all the comments around the table. I just have an observation and a question. Um, I know many um, essential service workers, many healthcare workers who have been living in their trailer in their driveway that have be, that has become um, a saving grace. They didn't have to go in and live with their family through COVID. And I'm wondering if we have a resurgence, if this passes in three, four months and we have a resurgence and they have to do that again, can they come back to council on those circumstances? So question for either Mr. Lustig or Mr. Herlovich, did one of you wanna address that question? So uh, your Worship, it's Al Alec Hurley speaking. So in response to Councillor Iannone, we have a temporary use bylaw on the council agenda today. The province passed legislation that said you don't need to advertise the public ahead of time. You don't need to uh, provide the appeal period after you pass it. So my suggestion would be that we incorporate um, the necessary wording to allow the use of trailers in um, as a temporary use for the purpose of um, COVID uh, accommodation, um, you know, until the emergent the province lifts the emergency measures um, provisions. I think that's great. If it, how, do we have a motion? Yes, we do. Okay, if that could be a friendly amendment, because I know a lot of, that was a saving grace for a lot of people that didn't have to go back into to their family homes. I know people who actually brought their trailers from Shirkston to their driveways so they could live in it while they worked the pandemic. Okay, so the mover and the seconder have agreed uh, that this would be a friendly amendment. So is there any other comments or questions of council? Okay, so we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Great, thank you. Um, item 7.5, there's a request to remove a condition of draft uh, plan approval for St. Thomas Moore subdivision. And if you remember, we were dealing with this, this is, uh, was condition 14, which was the automatic sprinkler unit in all residential units fronting on the extension. So do we have uh, a mover or do we have Councillor Peter Angelo? Did you wanna address this? Uh, yeah, sure, Your Worship. I mean, um, I know that the night that this came down to uh, City Council, uh, we had this application and then we had an application after this one. Um, the, uh, the solicitor who spoke after this one, uh, or after this application, talked about the fact that it was not a city policy yet. Um, and I think that the, that's, that's something that's important to note. Uh, actually, I think the solicitor talked about uh, two conditions that were part of the planning report that were not city policies. And uh, I, I remember staff's response in saying that, you know, collectively when, when an application goes around to the different departments, typically they, they take the comments and conditions that the other departments have, uh, have 
and they make them part of the uh, terms of reference or the terms of conditions that the applicant ends up agreeing to. I guess the only problem that, that I would have with that is, um, you know, we leave it up to the person who makes the applicant to know what the city policies are. And uh, in my opinion, I, I would think that, um, in my opinion, I, I would think that it would be appropriate to treat everyone fairly and that if it isn't a city policy, then it can't be part of a condition of approval. Um, and and that's, why we, that's why we find this one back in front of us, Your Worship, because I think it's starting to get out there now that the condition that was imposed on this developer is not actually part of a city policy. So um, there's another application as well that I know of where the developer is coming back to city staff and asking them to remove a condition that is not part of a city policy. So I, I can understand how people are starting to feel as though they're uh, being treated differently um, because some might have the condition in there, some might not have the condition in there, some might be aware that it's not a city policy, some are not aware that it's not a city policy. So, I mean, I would think it would be best to uh, have that open door policy where you want to treat everyone the exact same. And so I guess the motion I would make is, um, you know, that not only this condition be removed, but the motion I would make is that um, unless it's a city policy, it cannot be part of a condition of approval. Um, so I, I think that would give clear direction to staff to make sure that, you know, if they have something in mind that they want to put in as a condition of approval, uh, bring it to council, let council approve it as a city policy first, and then it can be, uh, and then it can, then it can become part of the conditions of approval. But until that time, um, you know, we shouldn't be putting things in there that we actually don't have the authority to do. So uh, that would be my motion, Your Worship. Okay. So the motion is, um, uh, your motion is first of all to allow the condition 14 uh, to be removed, Correct. and secondly, that our policy going forward is that unless it's part of our policy, it cannot be allowed into the application process as a requirement. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Councillor Kerry. Your Worship, that seems only fair. We've, we've sat in council and, and on the same night, see one developer who, was, who knew that it wasn't a policy, and obviously council voted against it because it wasn't a policy, and someone else didn't know and it got passed. It's not fair. I agree absolutely with Councillor Peter Angelo on second the motion. Thank you for that. Uh, anybody else uh, want to weigh in on this? Yeah, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I was. I think this is a fair and equitable way to deal with this. Although I remember the uh, speaker for that development, <laughs> yeah, who he was asked, "Do you want to have the sprinkler system?" <laughs> and he said, "Yes, no, we're okay with that." So, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, anyway, so, the fair way is what the, what the motion is, yeah. but they agreed with it at the time. Yeah, I know. Okay, if there's no further discussion on this, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Um, item 7.6, recognition of Wilma Morrison, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange. Yeah, so moved and so fitting. Yeah, you're exactly right. It was a great job uh, for a great lady. So we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that is approved unanimously. Item 7.7, .7, Speed Control Program Lawn Sign Road Safety Campaign. So we've got a recommendation from staff. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. Was that Councillor Dabrowski? Oh, uh, Councillor Dabrowski brought that forward? Oh, just fine. Just quickly wanted to, uh, through the mayor, thank Mr. Bilodeau and staff for their detailed and timely report. They turned it around quite quickly. I think the motion was brought up at the, the last council meeting, so um, I trust fellow council members. Obviously, a motion's already been laid on the table and seconded, but uh, anyway, thanks to Mr. Bilodeau and staff. So, Councillor Dabrowski, would you make that motion for us? Because Councillor Peter Angel withdrew his uh, motion, so since it's yours, he didn't yeah, want to I, steal your idea, your thunder. <laughs> <laughs> happy to make that motion 
Okay, motion by uh, Councilor Dabrowski, seconded by Councilor Peter Angelo. Uh, <laughs> I you can do it. the bylaws tonight. How's that? Uh, that council directs staff to implement a temporary lawn sign road safety campaign, which is great. I think it's a great idea. Those signs look terrific, and I think it'll draw attention to people speeding through areas, especially residential areas, that they'll sometimes they forget, and it'll be a great reminder. So we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Uh, 7.8, committee room upgrades. This is for committee room two downstairs and the McBain boardroom update. Motion by Councillor Thompson, count, second by Councillor Lococo. No, uh, I had questions. Yes, and questions, yeah. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just wondering, like the one is 70,000 and the other one is 10,000. $70,000 for one room, what, what exactly is that for? That seems to be a lot of money. So um, would uh, Ms. Clark uh, be able to answer that question? Ms. Clark? Oh, there we go. Hello, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry, which Yeah, so the question was, there's uh, $70,000 and $10,000 for the upgrades to committee room two and the McBain uh, boardroom. So Councillor Coco is asking, why is one so much more than the other? What's, what's the main differential, I guess? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I might have been looked at Sean, but I'm not sure. Um, I believe committee room two is getting um, quite the upgrade as that is our largest room for occupancy. So I know it's gonna have um, a lot of features uh, like calendars on the wall that tell you who's using it, occupancy sensors. So if no one's in it um, after 10 minutes, the calendar will reset itself. It will show it as free. Um, we're gonna be able to have um, electronic meetings with um, external individual like uh, companies or developers. Um, kind of similar to committee room one, whereas McBain's just getting a smaller refresh as it is one of our smaller boardrooms. But I could certainly have um, our IT staff send a more detailed email about it. Uh, yeah. well, yes, uh, Mr. CAO. That was, uh, that, was a, that was a very good response by the uh, finance director. But in committee room two, it has the ability to be broken into two parts as well. So it'll double as a large room with technology. And then when you divide the room into two, it'll have separate units so we can use it as two. We're going to need more committee rooms that are larger as we move forward. There's a few committee rooms in the building in, uh, in planning, for example, in municipal works that really will not be able to meet spacing requirements. So that's why we're looking at doing the larger room as we were in today and the room divided so it would provide two smaller committee rooms. So that's why the cost there is extra. Does that, is that good? Okay, thank you, Councillor. Thank you for the tag team response. Uh, we need a, a mo did we make the motion already? Yes, we had the motion, uh, yeah. And you second that, Councillor, okay. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. Uh, consent agenda, what's the will? Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to pull P BD 2020-46, the inclusionary zoning report, please. Okay, PBD 20, 20, 20, what was the number, 46? 46, yes. 46? Four, six. Four, six. Okay, 46, okay. Okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Campbell, that we uh, pass the rest of the uh, consent agenda. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you for that and PBD 2020-46, Inclusionary Zoning, uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had an opportunity to speak with Mr. Hurlovich regarding this and also Mr. Dick. Uh, re re I answered some of my questions. I had some inqu um, inquiries about back in 2016, had we had the Inclusionary Zoning, now with the 2019 More Homes, More Choices, would that have overridden the 2016 or would that have been grandfathered? So Mr. Hurlovich and, and Mr. Dick are going to be looking into that. I okay. was also questioning um, the report. It talked about downtown and I was wondering why downtown only and it was explained to me that it was 500 meters from a transit hub. So I understood that and then I thought, okay, well, our transit hub, go, go train uh, property is very large. Is that 500 meters from the front door? Or is that 500 meters from 
uh, one of the edges of the property because really that is only downtown and I was maybe I was incorrect but I was under the assumption assumption that inclusionary zoning would be for the whole community not just one area so we had some discussions and Mr. Herlovich and Mr. Dick are going to look into it a little, a little bit further I was also speaking to our member of parliament staff provincial parliament staff and they gave me some insight they're going to look into it further he just sent me an email with some more information which I haven't had an opportunity to read but he was talking about it being 500 meters to 800 meters plus or 10 minute walking so that might change it and um, there was some discussion about the possibility of the bill 197 reversing 108 but that's still being talked about so i would like to look into this further okay that's okay so you. are you are you deferring no we, we can accept it i just wanted to let people know that there's um, a lot more discussion going on outside of what's in the report okay yeah and bill 197 is just going through first reading yes. so it's an omnibus bill so it's got a lot of parts to it right yeah. Okay, so then you're gonna, are you making the recommendation or that the we- The recommendation uh, to accept the report and to continue to look into further information. Okay, uh, Councilor Peter Angel, were you um, seconding there? Yeah, okay. Um, actually, just really a comment. Um, I, I, was, I was surprised to learn as well about the, about the 500 meter uh, radius from a major transit hub. So in terms of inclusionary zoning um, in the region then, because only Grimsby, St. Catharines, and Niagara Falls are going to be the ones that end up with uh, a GO train hub, does that mean that the other nine municipalities would uh, not be able to have any type of inclusionary zoning um, in, their, in their official plan? Um, that, that just struck me as, as somewhat uh, uh, odd, I guess. Um, so I guess that would be my question, Your Worship. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Herlovich, do you know the answer to that? My gut reaction would be that his assumption, the counselor's assumption is correct, but I would rather look into that and respond to that question along with the questions that Councillor uh, Lococo has us looking at. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. You good with that, uh, Council? We get back. So we need a second, uh, seconder to the inclusion uh, motion. Okay, Councillor Campbell. Okay. So we'll call, we'll call the vote. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Okay. So we're into communications and comments of the city clerk. The first item is a recommendation for consideration about a resolution from the city of Welland. Um, regarding, um, oh, what is this one about here? Cannabis. Uh, cannabis. Okay. Okay. So a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Cario, that we uh, support the resolution. All, all those in favor? Okay. Opposed? Okay. Um, item nine point two. The City of Sarnia resolution for long-term care homes. There is a resolution here around the conditions of long-term care homes, and it's the belief of Sarnia that there should I'll be some. That, I'll move that support. Okay, moved by Councillor uh, Iononi, seconded by Councillor Strange, that we support the rec uh, resolution from the City of Sarnia in regard to long-term care homes. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Item 9.3, uh, correspondence from the Victoria Center BIA. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes, I've been uh, contacted uh, by a substantial number of people who are unhappy uh, with the cutting off of Center Street and uh, I have been going by there steady, and uh, at noon hour, there is basically, even on the weekend, anybody uh, using the patios. And talking to the people who are affected beyond this, they said, uh, why don't you uh, open it up till five o'clock, and we're happy to uh, uh, 
accept that and close it off for the evenings. And uh, so I would, uh, in looking at it, th this is what I see. And I think the uh, spicy olive has got a, a kind of a permanent type of thing. It would be difficult to move back and forth, but I think they could do something. So I don't want to go against the BIA, but I would like to refer this to staff to see if that's an alternative that can happen to uh, the other people at the other end of Center Street are suffering pretty bad. So Mr. I think Mayor. this is an, an alternative that maybe they uh, could, uh, that we should consider. So I would make a motion we refer it and go through the BIA and see if that is a possibility with our staff and with the BIA people. Yeah. You know, all of these people voted on Victoria Avenue, Clifton Hill, and really the people at the end couldn't uh, stop this, but now they're at, at least looking for some kind of a compromise with the situation. So refer it and see if we can work it out. Okay, so we've got a motion to refer it. Mr. Bill. I'll yep. second that. Okay, uh, second by council. Can we, once it's motion to refer, is this the same as defer we can't talk now? Mr. Clerk? Uh, refer it. Okay, what? so it's not, we can't talk any, it's not debatable, so we're gonna have to just vote on it now. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question for a clarification? A clarification question, yes. It, is the motion that staff decide whether or not the road is open? No, he asked for staff to report back to us with the information. That's no, that wasn't had. his motion. Well, no, I, his motion well, wasn't that staff report back. What was his it? His motion, I thought, was that the issue be referred to staff to see whether or not the road right. can be open right. until 5 p.m. Yeah. And only we can make that decision. So that's as that. a clarification, that's what I'm trying yeah, to- it has to come That's what to I'm us. trying to find out. Is it staff who makes the decision of whether or not the road is open until five o'clock, or is it this council? It's this council only. Okay, no. so if we- We can't talk about it. We're getting in dangerous territory, guys. Well, no, I'm asking for a clarification. Okay, so it's clarified. I mean, if Wayne, if you want to remove your motion so that we can have a discussion about it, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to break any rule, but I mean, I'm just asking for clarification. Okay, Who but we've already decision? clarified it now. So we've clarified it. So the motion was to ask for it to come back. Only council makes a decision. So if you want timing, something like that, we can do, but now we're going into dangerous territory, right? So is the motion then that staff bring a report back on the August 11th meeting? Or is the motion that- That's the clarification you can ask well, on the timing. That's the kind of clarification. So all we need to know, I are you think, asking? I think we could be uh, contacted as a council uh, through an email and vote to determine because there's a time factor here. So- Well, we've got a request by the BIA to- you can't No, you can't do that. And there's a request by the BIA that we leave this open until Labor Day, leave it as it is until Labor Day. That's yeah, the request I, by the BIA. Yeah. I, Withdraw your motion so we can talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and talk. All right. Okay. Well, I've got Councillor Iannone. Great. Got, or she's up next. Yes, Councillor Iannone. So we just did all that. We did a motion to refer, and Victor talked us right out of that to take off your motion. I, I, I thought there was no debate after that. Um, if we if we can discuss it now. We can like now. Council like Councillor Thompson, I've gone down there three times at mid-afternoon. There is nobody on Center Street. And I've gone down there the same evening and the closed area is packed. Okay. So I agree it benefits the restaurants and the businesses in the evening, but in the daytime, it is crucifying them. And it is particularly crucifying some of the businesses at the end where um, near Jack's. So I, I think, like Councillor Thompson, we need to have a report come back and tell us, and not August, 
whether we can do it at five o'clock. That was the compromise that had come to us in the first place. But it's not working out for some of the businesses down there. And I would have liked to think it would have, but like Councillor Thompson, I've gone down there three times and it's yeah, just dead. Yeah, nothing during the day. Okay. Uh, no, but in the evening, in the evening, it's, it's packed. Like it's a great opportunity for them at night, but in the daytime, it's useless. Okay, yeah. Councillor. Jack's place What's that? Yeah, I'm gonna get Mr. Uh, Mr. Bellado. Can we, excuse me, Councillor. Mr. Bellado, can you uh, address the reason we talked about last time, what the challenge was with opening it part way? Yeah, so staff have uh, implemented a number of measures for this closure to make sure that it's safe and that the occupants on the patios on Center Street um, have no conflicts with vehicles in the area. Uh, the biggest of which is those large flower planters that are placed at the intersection on Victoria Avenue. Um, that act as an impediment to block any vehicles that are on Victoria Avenue. In addition to that, uh, there are changes to the traffic signal lights that need to be done on a daily basis. If we were, we were back to open the intersection, uh, which is difficult given our resources, and there's also a number of items, uh, decorative items in the road closure section that will need to be removed. And most of the patios that are in there, or two of them for certain, are affixed to the ground that will need to be removed. So it's not a simple undertaking and it will require significant dollars and effort to do that on a daily basis. I want to- Councilor Strange. If I could speak to it as well. Yeah, oh, who, oh yeah, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Who said that? Oh, Councillor oh, Dabrowski. Oh, okay, do you mind if we'll do? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. I, yeah. yeah, no worry. It, it's so confusing on Zoom. I, I'm, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I know. Raise your leg. <laughs> yeah, Ray, really, I wish I could. Um, I've been down center well over the past couple of weeks since the, the last meeting supporting businesses in and around the area, uh, businesses on Center Street um, as well. And I, I still can't come up with any reasons how more businesses being open within a two mile radius of the closure, including those on the street closure would be negatively infected. It, I think it's simple math for me. It's more businesses closed equals less parking, less people staying overnight, less people spending money, and more businesses being open means more people parking, more people staying the night. I think to be successful, especially under the current economic circumstances that we're in, we have to be different. And we only have two months left of our core tourist season. And I think it's important that we do everything we can to support our local businesses. We need to think outside the box. I think talking about this further um, just is a, a backpedal for us. I, I think the, the BIA is making a reasonable uh, suggestion and a recommendation that they give this a go until Labor Day, and I think we, we should support that. But talking about it any further, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, coming back two weeks after uh, the streets open and expecting that places would be jam-packed I think is unreasonable. I think. Uh, we have to take baby steps and, and we're dealing with uh, circumstances that we haven't dealt with before. So I think we need to be patient and we need to give these businesses an opportunity to, uh, to grow their businesses, not only at, during the evening, but during the daytime as well. So I, I'm happy to support the, the recommendation from the BIA. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. Councillor Strange. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. And, and I totally did agree with uh, uh, Councillor Dabrowski at the, the beginning of this, and I really thought it would help businesses when it's closed, but unfortunately, it's not helping some businesses. No. You know, we thought, you know what, we, we, we uh, direct the traffic to go to some of these parking lots. Unfortunately, when you direct them, there's 10 other parking lots going towards this other parking lot. So before they get there, they, they'd rather park there. So, you know, we wanted to, to do something that was going to help um, struggling businesses and I thought it was an amazing idea and the people who are not helping they are coming up with a compromise and I, I think a compromise to to um, op or basically open it and close it at five at night I think is a good compromise and tons of co countries do this you know I don't agree with you know moving of flower pots and that is going to make a big deal or moving the furniture have to deal with it unfortunately I, I i wouldn't have agreed for someone to bolt their their patio in into the uh, into the road if that's what they did but then they're going to have to do a quick moving um because we want to help all businesses you know yeah. i agree you know i want to help those three or four businesses but there are businesses at the end of the street that uh they're not helping and they're taking a huge effect so i'd like to have the patience but what if 
one of these businesses goes, goes bankrupt because they've waited that long and it's not helping them. Like we have to come with some kind of compromise and I think the, the five o'clock um, time is, is a good, and if we can work with the city and, and find a way, if you put these flower pots on wheels that we can just wheel them, wheel them out, um, you know, at that five o'clock time, then they can set up the patio quick and then remove it you know, in the morning, then, then we go with that. We're here to help everybody, not just some businesses. And I would hate to, to see some businesses suffer just because of a simple road closure. Mr. Mayor? Uh, yeah, I've got Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I, I really think it's a reasonable compromise, and that's why uh, I had asked the mover to remove their motion, is because I don't want to wait another uh, month just for a report uh, on doing something that we already know can be done. Uh, is it going to be the easiest path that we take? No, it's not. But as was already mentioned a couple of times, we want to try to help all businesses. And right now, we've hurt some by closing the actual street. And if you take a look at the time that, uh, you know, we're asking for the street to be open, I believe that there aren't even all the businesses on Center Street that are open at that time. And I mean, I know Councillor Thompson said he's gone down there. I'm, I'm sure a number of us have seen pictures because they've all been uh, sent to us because it was our decision. So we're wearing it. And at that time of the day, Your Worship, there really isn't a lot of business going on there. So uh, I think it's very reasonable to say that the street be opened until 5 p.m. Um, I, I, I think for now anyway, until phase three, that would be the best course of action. I'd be happy to make the motion unless Councillor Thompson wants to actually make the motion that the street be opened until 5 p.m. and I'll defer to him if he wants well, to make just it. Just before if you not, make I a will. motion, I'm gonna weigh in on it too and yep. give my opinion. I don't mind. I'm, I, I'm, am yeah. I allowed to make a motion? What's that? Am I allowed to make a motion? Are you allowed to? Yeah, of course. Oh, okay, then then I'll make that motion. So uh, something for consideration, and I think two things. Number one, we need to be talking to the BIA. How often do we tell the BIA what we're going to do in their area? <laughs> we always ask them, and there's a lot of examples where we want to know what they want to do. So they've done their own surveys, they've done their own work, and now we're going to just flip because now it's going to mean businesses, time frame we need to, I'm going to get to you. I'm going to talk yeah. now. And, and the question is, businesses that have already affixed their, their guardrails into the asphalt, that have made the commitment, the next thing is, uh, we've got these planters that you need a front end loader, not people. People can't move these things. You need some machinery to move them. And the question is, where are we going to move them to? The other thing I'll tell you, I've spoken with a lot of these businesses. They're, they're not busy at five, some of them are busy at two or three in the afternoon. So the question is, what piece are they going to miss there? And I'll tell you right now, I talked to one of the owners yesterday. There's five restaurants uh, uh, in this stretch, and, and, I'm, and I agree with what Councillor Dabrowski is saying. If these businesses don't make it, I know one restaurant told me he's out 100000 already. He's struggling to hang on. And, and if he's not there, you don't need parking lots. And, and that's the biggest concern. And, and is, these guys are doing all they can to help promote people going there. And I'm sorry, I'm down there. I see where, who's parking where. I'm not buying it that he's, not, that he's losing out in the business. Sorry, I've been walking down there, talking to all the businesses. And, and I'm, I'm not opposed to the idea of everybody winning, but my concern is how the heck are you going to do this and who's going to pay for it? Because are we going to say the BIA, you got to bring in and move all this equipment every day? And then there's reprogramming of the lights every day with the region, and then there's going to the businesses to move their fencing. That's right now, and it took them an entire day uh, at least to set that up. So the question is, how are they now gonna go and do this? And, and I don't need to tell anyone, try to find two by fours these days and patio stuff. It's very hard to find because everybody's doing the same thing. So uh, is what we're asking them possible? Who's gonna pay? And what time frame are, would we give them to do it? And what time are we just going to arbitrarily pick five o'clock without talking to anybody? So I just want to throw some things out for discussion because I've been down there. Canada Day, I spent the whole day. I've been down there many times talking to all the businesses up Allen, up Victoria, up Center. And I'm, and I'm just concerned that we're doing a quick knee jerk de decision. And I don't know that we've talked to anyone to get the answers to these questions. And that's my concern. So, Councillor Peter Angelo, and then Councillor Thompson. Did, do you have, okay, Councillor. 
Councillor Thompson. And myself, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. And Councillor Iannone. Well, first of all, um, Victoria Avenue and Clifton Hill are not uh, affected. It's the people who are to the north of uh, where the road is cut off. And you got uh, probably eight, ten businesses there. There are three restaurants in the closed off area. And uh, there's nobody there, even on the weekends at 12 o'clock. And I've talked to the people up in the, the uh, other end of uh, Center Street, and they said, you know, we'd be willing to compromise and just uh, have uh, up till five o'clock open us up. Now, the two big pots, put them on the sidewalk and get them out of the way. You don't have to have them on the road. And uh, there's only one that I saw that looked a little bit complicated, spicy olive with their uh, patio. But the other ones could pull it off very easy. Well, Sparks I, I, is screwed into the, into the street. Huh? Yeah, sparks. Well, one of them, okay, yeah. Anyway, I, I said go to the BIA, work with staff to see if this is a possibility. But he's su suggesting we do it. Um, you know, we can always get the information quick as a council to make a decision. We don't have to have a meeting to do that. So I'll second his motion. Councilor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I'm going to echo Councillor Strange, Thompson, Peter Angelo, and myself all said the same thing. Um, only two to three businesses are are um, benefiting from that street being closed for that span of time. And I don't even think those three businesses are making any money before four o'clock because of the street being closed. Um, you, you said you've been down there. We've all got the pictures. Anywhere between 12 and three, 12 and four, it's dead. And it doesn't matter, and I've gone all different times. I'm sure so is Councillor Thompson. Um, I don't, I didn't think our purpose for that was to only have three businesses thrive. Mm -hmm. I, and, and I didn't think we did it so that businesses who have been there forever and are also economically hurting, whether you believe they are or not, they're telling us they are, um, should bear the brunt of three businesses making um, being able to benefit from this. So I support the motion. I'm glad, I'm, take back Victor, I'm glad that you did interrupt that. And I think that that's a much better motion and will definitely help those that are hurting from the all day, from the all day closure. Councillor Dabrowski. Yeah, just to speak to that, I know Queen Street is having some challenges as well, but if we're at the mindset that only the three businesses that are affected by the street closure won't positively affect 20 or 30 businesses around it. I, I just have to disagree. Um, and at the same time, it, it's, we're still, we're, we're six weeks to go in the core tourist season and we're back and forth on this. And for anybody that's owned a business or, or marketed a business in the past, if, if we sit around the table and believe that in two weeks, we're able to market properly. The fact that these businesses are open, they're just, they're starting from nothing literally like starting from day one, a soft opening for a brand new business and trying to communicate to people that they're now open throughout the day or throughout the evening. So I think if we don't give them enough time to, to market themselves properly, then I don't think we're doing our due diligence. We, we can't all agree, but that's my two cents on the subject and I won't support uh, the motion. Okay, so Councilor Pierangelo, did you want to make your motion? Uh, well, you didn't, you, you, you didn't mention who's gonna pay you didn't mention any of those other details. So you can't just, so who's gonna pay for it? Is it the city or is it well, the BIA? It would be the city's responsibility to open and close the regulation. So it is, but who would pay for it? The city. Okay. Yeah. So, no, Mr. Sorry. Clerk, do you have any questions or do you understand the motion? <clears throat> well, the first motion was, was pulled. So I'm assuming it's, the, it's that first motion that's back on the floor again. And if so, it reads that it's referred to staff to work with the BIA to see if the opening of the street during the day until 5 p.m., then close off the street 
and report back to council on August 11th before a decision is made. Well, that's why I said you no, should No, that motion it. changed. Yeah, we'll let the mover talk to it. Yeah, Your Worship, I mean, that was the whole uh, intent of actually having the discussion is because referring it to staff just would have meant that we would have had to wait another month before a report actually came back to us. The intent of my motion was simply just to open the road but close it at 5 p.m. Um, so that uh, I guess we could have some traffic moving through there during the day. Uh, that was simply my motion until phase three, Your Worship, and then phase three, everything goes back to normal. Now, can I ask you a question, Councillor? This motion, why five o'clock? So if dinner hour starts at five and they need time, if this is gonna happen, they gotta take all their tables and chairs out from inside and they gotta be ready for dinner time. And I was talking to the owner of one of these restaurants who at, at two in the afternoon, he had a good crowd two days ago. So question is, so that's gone now. So in this, at five o'clock, opening at five? So if it closes, down at five is that enough time for them to get ready reasonably to be ready for it um your worship I, I i think when we first dealt with this motion there were a lot of businesses that were north of ellen avenue that were saying that they would compromise even for a six o'clock closing um so uh I, I thought five would be uh, more reasonable in terms of it, it would be closing earlier than six which would actually give them the setup time uh, I mean, uh, you know, aside from that, right, I mean, you know, you could basically uh, pick any hour that you wanted to. Um, it's, it, it's really just based on the fact that uh, I don't think that the businesses on Center Street are, um, are doing a lot during the day. And so why not allow the street to open during that time so that the businesses behind it can actually get some traffic? That, that was the mind thought, Your Worship. Um, so in terms of uh, six o'clock, uh, five o'clock, um, four o'clock, I mean, I don't think I would go to uh, two o'clock. Um, I think five o'clock is, is, is fairly reasonable. I just, I would hope you'd consider, because I, I want to support this, five o'clock's too late, especially considering now they've got all this wide open time. I don't know how long it's going to take to move all the furniture out and-, and, and uh, Mr. Yeah. Billado is trying to- yeah, I'm sorry. I've got, uh, okay, Mr. Billado. Sorry. Thank you. If I can just add one other thing or provide some clarification for what's involved in changing the signals. It's not as simple as running a different program. Uh, there has been a number of changes that have been made. We've bagged signal heads. This requires overhead work with the Niagara region. Uh, if we were to do that on a daily basis, we'd also need the police there. So it's a very large undertaking for us to do daily. And to be honest, it's, it would be very challenging for us to meet those delays or, or timelines because this service is on demand. So we cannot guarantee that the region would be at the location every day at the same time. We cannot guarantee that we'd have a police officer available every day at the same time to make that happen. So it's going to be very challenging for us to do this on a daily basis. And I just thought that would help provide some context in your decision making. So thank you. Put it back to Thank you, Councillor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When we first brought this up, I was of the, the mind to do the 5 p.m. closure, and that would be a compromise for everyone, and hopefully it would work. And then after listening to Mr. Billado last time about all of the things that needed to be done, that made me rethink whether we wanted to do it. That's why I voted this way. One of the things that Councillor Peter Angelo just talked about was until phase three we're hearing that phase three is probably going to be on the 24th, Friday the 24th. We're on the 14th now. Do we go through all of this for 10 days? And then when phase three comes in, they open up the restaurants and then the, the, the road is open? Is that the, the intention? Hmm. Well, the, the motion or the um, request from the BIA is to do this until September the 8th. I know there was discussion ending it when we got into phase three. So I know I've heard both discussions from them because they're trying to figure it out too. And, and like I said, you know, the, the parking lot can benefit from successful restaurants. Successful restaurants are gonna wanna use the closest parking lot. That's to me, it's very symbiotic. I don't see how they don't see they're tied together. They're not separate. And people, if they're gonna go to Clifton Hill, they're gonna park on Clifton Hill. If they're gonna go to those restaurants. And I know because I go to those restaurants, I park up there. That's why I don't understand. To me, it's a no brainer. 
but go ahead council just one more comment I, I was trying to picture a busy center street clifton hill with people walking all over the place and then city vehicles coming in and trying to move planters and and um road closure signs and do all of that and i'm wondering if there's a safety issue with that as well so until mr billado brought all of that up i didn't think of that um I, I would like to try to do something to benefit everybody a little bit instead of just a few businesses and not benefit others but i see the challenges that we have with doing the daily closure and reopen I, i'm not sure where i'm going with this yeah i'm sorry uh who is that? It's uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Dabrowski. If I could just weigh in on that and to Councillor Lacoco's point, I, I think we have to envision this as a street festival, a springlicious or a, a food festival um, running for three days or for seven, seven days for a full week and, and having them tear down and set up every day. I, I don't think it logistically makes sense. I, I don't think it's us being rational and giving uh, the businesses a, a fair opportunity to, to run their business. So I think before we make a decision, we really need to think about the logistics involved. I think Mr. Bilodeau has made a couple of good points. I just don't think it it makes it makes sense to have a street closed until four o'clock or five o'clock. And Mr. Mayor brought up a good point as well. People like to go for dinner at four o'clock or, or three thirty, um, and taking time to open and close the street each day won't, won't allow for that. Again, I can't support the motion on the table, but uh, glad we're having this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Councilor Strange? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. And, and when we first implemented this, we said we would come back to this meeting and have a discussion about, you know, we didn't want to wait till the end of the summer, whether it's phase three or whatever it is. But we, th and I personally thought that, that these uh, places were going to thrive from it, but unfortunately it's not. So, you know, if a business is losing two to three thousand dollars a day and said, oh, maybe we'll wait till the summer to see if they, well, you add that up over the summer, they're out of business. So people do this cities do this all over the world where they close down streets at certain times and if you want to go for a four o'clock i'm happy to do a four o'clock because these guys are going to compromise we want to help all businesses not just the ones and they're thriving it's doing great and i love the idea i wish like like i said before there were all walking streets everywhere but i don't want to hurt any businesses while this is happening i would hate to see any business go bankrupt you know they're losing thousands and thousands every day because they're going other places you know, so, you know, I, I would like to, even if it's, even if you amend it to, to four o'clock, I'm fine with that. You know, some of the other considerations I'm thinking too is, I know what you're talking about, other festival areas that do that, that they'll use stanchions, uh, they can move things. I don't know, like a lot of these guys have brought in, they've rented picnic tables or bought picnic tables. I don't even know where they're gonna, supposed to put these. And if you put them on the sidewalk, then people got to walk on the road. I, I, I'm just concerned there's a number of, and also had we thought this, more thoroughly through in the beginning, it could have been planned in such a way for being portable. Because you're right, Quebec City, uh, Amsterdam, lots of places, they, they, you're exactly what you're saying. But if you go down there and sit in these restaurants, see, they, they haven't planned for this this year. They're desperate and they, are, they have been very busy in the last few weeks. This past weekend, they were very busy, even after the rain. Clifton Hill, after the rain, full. So finally, they're starting to come back, but they're creeping back. We're not anywhere near where we were before. The hotels are running between, some are at 3% capacity. Most of them are at 10% capacity. Everybody's hurting right now. So anything that brings people to the area that's exciting, other than the old usual, and even when they do get open in phase three, they're gonna be at a third to half capacity. You know, the casino is gonna open up, allowing 50 people, 50 people in the casino. That's what they're going to be in phase three. So uh, there, we got lots of challenges ahead of us, guys. I just want us to make sure that, that we're thinking this one through. I don't know physically how we're going to do this. Uh, I, I wish if there's a way to do this, I 100% would support that, doing the compromise. Mid-afternoon, uh, closing it down till night, and then doing it over again. I totally would support that. I just don't know physically how it's going to happen. We're just saying, okay, staff, figure it out. And we got... Mr. Billado telling us it's not quite that easy, you know, and, and on the weekends, hopefully we're going to have a good August. It's going to, it's going to be a challenge. I don't, I just don't know if we, you know, are we better off? Can we make a motion that was subject to motion? So we don't have to wait till our August meeting and give staff some time to figure out how this could potentially happen. I just don't know where everyone's going to put everything. And I'm sure these business owners, they've already had four months of nothing. And now they're going to say, well, like, geez, I don't know. Where am I supposed I don't know. I don't know. 
I just want to I just want us to make sure that we think this through from a bit the business's perspective because they are doing very good and like I say mid afternoon they're starting to fill up and you're right it's empty the whole first half of the day it's completely empty and I agree because I went by the other one day and I thought Canada Day as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking boy there's got to be a better way and I thought we just got to think and be more proactively planning this out if we're to do this in the future so that we don't have this dilemma because then it, you get the best of both worlds Councillor Strange. Yeah, and, and I agree, but we we started this. We didn't tell the businesses to, to bolt your patio furniture into the the road. You know, I think when we first started this, we were going to come back with, you know, uh, whatever it's going to be, good things, bad things, whatever it is, and on this council meeting. So to, to think that we thought, oh, this was going to be permanent until we had to come back with a discussion because we, we, I thought everyone was gonna thrive from this, but unfortunately they're not. And there are places where they can put their patio furniture, it's not even stage three yet, so put it in the restaurant while they do that, or there's tons of room on the actual sidewalk. So if somebody wants to eat or drink during the afternoon, they can still go on the sidewalk there. There's plenty of tables and stuff, especially if there's only you know, three or four, or four couples that are going to different places. So, you know, I, I think this is a good idea, and I think it works for everybody. And it's, and and I would hate to see, like I said, if it was if it was a parking lot or a bar or a motel or something to go on a business because we didn't compromise and and help these owners out. Mr. Mayor, yes, uh, Hello, yes. Mayor. it's Serge. Serge, um, just wondering, just in terms of getting the cost, as as I know that staff met on site and there was a lot of safety issues, but in terms of trying to determine. Because there's other people we'd have to get involved. Obviously, Matt said the police. We'd have to make sure they're available every day. And the region staff, they came with a full crew. There was like three or four trucks doing the lights. And I'm just wondering if we could have a day or two to go speak to them to say, hey, can they commit to this? I understood from Matt it was about 1000 to $1,500 a day to do this. So if we're doing this seven days a week, if council then uh, mm -hmm. confirms they're going to cover the eight to $10,000 a week to, to do this. But we need to go back to some of these partners to see if they can even take this on. Obviously, we want to do this. This was something that came from the BIA. It didn't come from staff in this request. They, in their letter, they also indicate the most recent uh, correspondence. They're saying, hey, we're going to come back to council on, in phase three. In phase three, we understand and determine once if restaurants are part of it, which we think they will be, that they would open the roads. So we're talking a couple of weeks. But at the very least, I think uh, uh, we need to kind of determine if we can get the region on side because they did it when they actually did the changes. It was at six or seven in the morning. Matt can correct me, but it was very early because they didn't want to deal with traffic uh, in the middle of the day because it makes it much more complicated. So if they're going to do this, we'd have it, that's why they did the, the changes. So we'd have to go back to them and, and maybe it might take a couple of police officers off duties. And I think it took them two or three hours they were out there, if I'm not mistaken, Matt. So I think we need more of this detail to share with council so you understand the, uh, the, the, the technical side and the timing that would be required for them to do this on a daily basis and the cost. But maybe we come back in a couple of days, two or three days and, and share this with, uh, with council via uh, an email if that works. You guys wanna do a special meeting? Like we can call a special meeting next week to deal with this. I mean- Mr. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a question? Yeah, just sorry, Councillor uh, Campbell was just speaking. We potentially have one. Yeah, yeah, we do. That's right for the masks. Yes, Councillor Iononi. Um, thank you. When when phase three opens, restaurants cannot go back to a hundred percent. What was it? Thirty percent. Well, we're thirty to fifty. I know, Serge. Do you know that oh. number? Uh, yeah, I think it's in there. Or could be. There's. We're still trying to get that number, but it's it's obviously okay. half of actual capacity of what they have inside. So I would think that they would still need to have that patio space. Yeah. So I'm not looking at it as something that stops on phase three because they are still not gonna be able to go back to full capacity. So they're still going to need to augment that patio space. So I think it's something we have to deal with sooner than later because I don't think we should be doing it for certain businesses that hurt other businesses. So I don't see phase three as being the answer. I just see phase three as being an addendum to the the patio use already because that might be able to bring them up to 50 percent if it's 30 percent using a patio might be able to bring them up to 50 percent but they're not going to be able to fill that restaurant fill those restaurants so i think it's something that we have to 
keep going on a long term through the summer, not look at it ending at phase three, but fixing the problem we have with the businesses that's hurting right now. Thank you. Councilor Thompson. <clears throat> yeah, to uh, Mr. Bellado. Um, can't you put the traffic lights back to normal and just leave them there? And you're going to put a barrier at the uh, corner and not worry about that? Mr. Bellado? When we change the operation of the signal, we have to go through a legal process um, that legally changes the description and the operation of the signal. Um, we can't keep the phases running that normally are there if the road is closed because there's indications that need to be closed. We also made special allowances for pedestrians in that area. When we had the original signal timing, it wasn't operating properly because pedestrians were blocking all of the traffic exiting Clifton Hill. And it basically only allowed for a couple of vehicles to turn, which resulted in significant queuing on Clifton Hill. We made some changes at the request of the Clifton Hill businesses. Um, so we need to keep that special signal timing in while Center Street is closed. Well, that's uh, too bad because, you know, you're talking about parking. We're not talking just about parking. The bar right next door at the other corner at the end uh, is going to be going to go bankrupt. And the why motels. Would, why would you go bankrupt? Everybody's in that area. No, it's, it's, cutting it off has killed the business. I can't see that happening. Yeah, well, that's what happens. And you got a legal letter. Uh, on the agenda um, questioning the cutting off that we have to deal with also. Anyway, it's uh, a sad situation. We made a mistake. Well, I don't know if we made a mistake. I think we made a good decision and maybe we could have uh, thought it through in a way that was more adaptable, but I think it was a great move. So if not, we'd be saying goodbye to a bunch of businesses on that street, and the parking lot wouldn't be required. Well, no, <laughs> okay, all right. So, okay. you watch and see what happens. Okay. Well, we have a vote. Yeah. So, uh, no, but Mr. Mayor. Yes. Can Council. I ask the question? Yes. Um. And at some point through this process, when whenever, whatever we decide to do. There was a whole issue on a Saturday in regards to signage. Everybody remembers getting those plethora of texts. texts. And so a bit, one of the businesses had put a sign up on the street that had been moved because it was an illegal sign. Um, can we not make allowances for that also? Because they, the problem, when, when Center Street was closed, the problem for those businesses was not so bad when that sign was up. It became 10 times worse when that sign came down. I don't, I don't know Do you know what I'm talking about? We were all on, we were all getting texts on the weekend. Um, one of the businesses had made a sign saying what restaurants were on that street and where alternate parking was on the other end of the, from, from Ferry on the other end of the closed center street. And the, and the sign was put along the barrier where there were other signs and our, and the city went in and took the sign out. Yeah, because Mr. Mayor, was, Mr. Mayor if I yeah. could, just on yeah, that Ms. point. Mr. Fellas, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so we were actually called by the BA. The sign was a bit mis was misleading. It said free parking on, on Ellen Avenue. And what was happening is we were getting calls by the other uh, parking lot operators because it was one operator who put it up. And they said, and they were getting people going to their parking lot saying, uh, we said it was free parking. There's a big sign that says free parking. And so the BIA then asked us, along with the, some other, a number of their other members, to take it down. So that's why it was taken down. So, And then the BIA has placed a banner since then indicating there's these other uh, the businesses are open and, and parking is available in the back etc and i think staff and matt can speak to this too i think the city put up some additional parking uh directional signage matt i think that's uh, been put in place mr Bill, yeah. along all the cross streets on victoria avenue we put up additional signing uh directing folks and indicating that ellen avenue businesses are open uh, we didn't specify a specific business but we kept it general in terms 
Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, Councilor Peter Angel. Yeah, Your Worship, I, I was just gonna say that the city is the one who should be in charge of putting any signage up. You can't have uh, you know, 30 different businesses putting uh, their own signs up on, on the city poles. And you know, in terms of trying to appease the businesses that are uh, on the north side of Ellen Avenue, perhaps this latest compromise that's on the table right now will be something that, that does appease them so there won't be the need for extra signage. So maybe we can just see how it goes from here on in. Okay, so um, Mr. Clerk, do you understand the, the motion or do you got it down or do you want it repeated? I think it would benefit everyone in the room on Zoom and listening at home if it was repeated. Okay, Councilor Peter Angelo. Um, sure, Your Worship. Um, I mean, my motion simply would be that uh, that Center Street is open until 5 p.m. Uh, daily. Until Five or four? And, and would it help you to support it, Your Worship? That, that's my question, because my, my original motion was five, and I know you said that you would like to support the motion if it was a little bit earlier. Would it help you to support yes, it if it, it was 4 p.m.? I think it would help me to okay, support then, it. Okay, then, then 4 p.m. it is. Three would be great. 4 p.m. <laughs> 4 p.m. 4 p.m. it is, Your Worship, until phase three, okay? And the city uh, cover the costs associated right. with uh, opening and closing the street down. Okay, Mr. Clerk, you got that? Oh, uh, uh, Councillor Dabrowski. Can I make a friendly amendment? I know we're, we're laughing about it, but I, I do believe that three o'clock, especially when they're they're trying to attract a dinner crowd and trying to get their, their powers up and running, that one hour does make a big difference. I'm, and I know we're kind of joking about it, but I'm wondering if we can go to 3 p.m. Uh, your Worship, I think the is very reasonable. Uh, they started at six, we're now at four. And they have sidewalks. So they can put okay. I'm not uh, joking about this. I had conversations with people who are in serious financial trouble because of our decision. And I think anything we can do to try to help is gonna be uh, a savings for them, so. Well, I think it's COVID. It's not our decision, it's COVID. Everybody's hurting right now in this town. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got the motion, uh, sorry, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to bring up phase three again because we were originally closed it until September, but we were going to discuss it and now phase three is here. If phase three comes on the 24th, so it would be open until four o'clock, you close it at four o'clock till the 24th and then what happens? I just want some clarification. Well, nothing's gonna happen until our next council meeting. Well, my at motion is until phase three, your worship. What's that? My motion was until phase three. Then what happens? Then what happens? Well, I don't know that we've got anything that says it opens in phase three. I'm not sure that, that that's not clear to anybody. Well, I remember asking at the last council meeting and Mr. Todd uh, uh, answered my question. And I said, if we make this motion and go forward with the road closure, would they have to come back here to close the road again for phase three? And the answer was yes, they would have to come back to close the road. That means the road is open, in my opinion. That was the question I asked. That was the answer I received. Well, why don't we just clarify it here right now? Well, I mean, make that's it. Fine. I mean, I think it's until phase three, to be honest with you. Um, I don't understand, you know, why, well, why, why, why would I, you do it farther than that? If you want to reevaluate it again, then call a special meeting when phase three. Then We're going to have one anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Matt, Mr. Balladeau, Billado. Just while you're crafting this motion, just a point of clarification for myself and staff. Um, is the intention for us to start closing the road at three and likely be completed two hours, say, afterwards, or be completed by three, which would then result in us starting earlier in the afternoon? Four. So, he, so Councillor Peter Angel is suggesting you start at four uh, to uh, close it down. As soon as you start, it's closed. I know, but how soon are the businesses open? That's the thing. We got this. Is it a two-hour window? Well, as soon as he starts, it's closed. <clears throat> when is it safe for people to be sitting at tables and chairs in the middle of the street? That's a question. 
I know Mr. Bilodeau, if you know the answer to that. Will require some time to get in there with the heavy equipment to move the planters on a daily basis. That will require some time. Then I suspect it'll take some time as well for the restaurants to set up their patios. So I'm not sure the timeline specifically, but it's gonna take a while. Why would they have to move the planters every day? Well, they're in the middle of the street. I know, put them on the sidewalk. Could that be done, uh, Mr. Bilodeau? Like, could, is there another way of closing it that doesn't involve the planters in the middle of the street? Is there another way of doing it safely? Um, in other instances, we've utilized uh, city vehicles, large city dump trucks uh, to block the road. Oh, wow. So that, that's something we've done before at the request of the police, uh, to make sure that risk were mitigated in the area. Okay, uh, Councilor Lococo. Mr. Mayor, what about those um, those wooden barriers? Blockades. Yeah. Blockades. Uh, there's a special term for them. I can't think of it right now. Yeah, well, not the construction, <laughs> but maybe look, make them look a little bit nicer than just you know construction orange. Those are easily moved. I, I don't know. I just think a our suggestion. CAO is going to jump well, in. Well, Mr. Mayor, uh, you have to remember that these measures are put in place to protect the city and to protect the patrons that are using these patios. We're not talking about small little flower planters like you have in your backyard. These things probably weigh a couple thousand pounds because they're meant to be there to stop a car coming up the hill and ramming into people that are sitting on the patios. These aren't insignificant. Uh, they take uh, heavy equipment to move them into place every day. You're not gonna put them on a sidewalk because now people will have to walk on the road to get around these flower planters. You're not gonna store picnic tables and stuff on sidewalks because people will have to walk on the road to get around them. You're talking about a couple of hours set up by traffic people at four o'clock. You're now talking about probably having the regional staff coming in on overtime because they have to get this opened up by what time in the morning would you like it open? We'd like to have to have staff there in the middle of the night just opening this up so that the parking lot owners and businesses can have people uh, into their businesses by what, seven o'clock in the morning. So um, this is not a simple thing. I realize what they do in Europe, but in Europe they're doing it every day, 365 days a year where they actually have electronic bollards that retract into the street come back up to protect everybody and they, they have this down to an art. These aren't something what they're doing during a COVID period. Um, as our staff's indicated, this could probably be something like $10,000 a week uh, to do set up and take down. And that's fine if council wants to commit that money. My concern hearing Mr. Billado and others is that there's logistics here that we just may not be able to meet some of these timelines. If the regional staff aren't there to be able to change these lights over, we may have an issue where we may not have this open at seven o'clock in the morning. And we haven't even heard that part of the discussion as to what time do you want this open by? Are they doing tear up down right after midnight or are we having to have it open for seven o'clock in the morning? It's one thing to close it down, it's another thing to have to open it up as well. So staff's gonna try their best to do this, but I just sitting here knowing and watching the angst on some of the staff's faces on the Zoom screens is that logistically, uh, we just may not be able to deliver as council may wish on some of the stuff depending on how our other partners, whether it's police, we're gonna have to have police there helping us, uh, closing down and, and opening up. Um, that's gonna be their time commitment. We're gonna have to have the regional staff that are there doing the signalization. And we're gonna have to have city crews there uh, lifting these baller or uh, flower planters and stuff out of the way and storing them in a location that's somewhere in the Center Street area. So logistically, there's a lot here to consider. Um, I mean, if that's council wish, we'll try to make it happen, but um, there's definitely a cost, logistics and time commitment that we're gonna have to pull off to make this happen. It's probably cheaper just to give, uh, give this money, money 10000 a week and subsidize the businesses. Perfect. 
probably be safer and simpler and cheaper. Is that a motion? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be willing to do that. I think Mr. Mr. Felicetti said it best. This wasn't staff coming to you. This was the BIA, and it was your motion here as a council to support the BIA. So I don't want to make it like this was staff's idea or recommendation. This came strictly from uh, the business association in that area. Uh, any uh, feedback, Councillor Pierangelo? Uh, I mean, we can call the vote, but uh, he's left some questions, though. I, I, I just, I just want to make sure that we address it. We don't just blindly a uh, vote without addressing, like, the money, $10,000 a week. Uh, well, and Mr. Mayor, one thing we do need, we do need clarified in the motion. What time do you want this street open back up? So, no set time, Councilor. And I don't, I don't even know if business. Sorry, I don't even know if businesses are they operating that early on Center Street in the morning. Uh, you, what, what do you mean? Uh, like at eight in the morning, or like the is there any businesses maybe? on Center Street itself that are operating at like eight? Oh, in, oh yeah. Center Street. Yeah. Well, the parking lot. I don't know when do people start parking. I don't know. Like, uh, actually, uh, yeah, Councilor. That's a great question. So which businesses are, are being affected by the closure? What what type of businesses? I know we've heard parking lots, but if there's not businesses open at 7 o'clock or 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning, who really is parking there? I, I just, uh, I'm not sure if anyone can answer that, but I'm <laughs> which businesses that are um, negatively saying they're impacted, which type of businesses are those aside from parking lots? Well, I think there was a, a, a bar and as well as a couple motels, I believe. I mean, bars typically don't open until after uh, Well, they, they could open at 9 if they want, but I don't think they do. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Nice try. Councillor, uh, well, okay, we got Councillor Campbell's been waiting to speak. Sorry, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Todd made a good comment. Uh, why is, is it our responsibility to finance this? If that is the request of the BIA, uh, let's do it, and they can pay for it. Mr. Mayor? Yes? I, I guess that point, I, I don't think it's the BIA, though, that's asking us to set up and take down. That's part of the problem. Their, their request was that we ride this out until Labor Day. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, that's something we could ask him. Mr. Phyllis said he suggested a couple of days for us to try to work the logistics out on this, and those are certainly questions we could ask him. I mean, we could, you guys, if you guys are so inclined, we could, we can call a meeting uh, next week, you know, for an hour to discuss this and give staff time to come back to us because everyone's guessing, you know, and then they can go to the police, they can go to the region, they can go to the BIA uh, and, and see what they really want to do. I don't know, Council. I just want to throw it out there because it seems we got a lot of questions, not a lot of answers. Well, no pun intended, but I just think we're finding roadblocks. <laughs> well, if well, if you, if you want the your, the motion to stand as it is, then then we'll call it. Right. Okay. And so moved by Councillor Pierangelo, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Is that right? That the uh, the road closures. <laughs> Um, uh, be done at 4 p.m. each day and then open back up at the end of the day and the city uh, to cover the expenses of doing that. Okay, we're good. So we'll call the vote. All those in favor? One, two, three, uh, I can't tell, uh, four. And opposed? One, two, three. Uh, are we missing somebody? Hold on. You had to call call for four. What's that? Oh, you have conflict. Okay, so I'm sorry. Help me out here, Mr. Clerk. Four in favor, three opposed. Okay, so it's passed. Okay. No, we'll just let it go. I have no problem. Then it won't pass. 
Okay, so we've got. Uh, file the next one you okay, 9.4, receive and file. Uh, yes, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had a question. Um, the region talks about uh, anti racism, and I'm wondering if we can have oh, an update. What are we on? Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped. Yep, Never. we're just dealing with the uh, correspondence yep. from Daniel and Daniel. So, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo to receive and file. Uh, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Um, okay, 9.5, declaration of public health issue. Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to receive and file it, but I do have a question on an update on our anti-racism committee. Okay. What the status is, timing, that sort of thing. Uh, okay. Um, Nothing. Who's, uh, who would answer that one, um, uh, Mr. CAO? Well, Mr. Mayor, I, I don't believe we've uh, commenced the advertising for the committee. Um, we haven't got a terms of reference set for the committee yet. Okay. I know staff discussed it at their last council review meeting, but I'm not sure it's advanced very far based on, you know, being in the middle of COVID things that are taking quite a bit of staff's time doing other things right now. Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do appreciate that, but can we have some sort of timeline on it? I know that there's a lot of people that would like to work on the terms of reference and maybe it doesn't have to be staff. Um, at least advertise and get resumes and see who's interested and they can work on the terms of reference since it's a brand new committee. Just a suggestion. Well, Mr. Mayor, usually what happens is that the terms of reference set by council first and uh, once that terms of reference is set for the committee, then we would go out and advertise. You have to determine uh, number of members, uh, number of councillors are going to sit on it, number of members of the public, what the qualifications that you're looking for, what the mandate or focus of the committee is going to be. All that would have to be brought back in a report uh, considered by council before we'd actually do the advertising. Okay, council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do accept that, but can we have a date when this could get, get started? Well, I would suggest, uh, you know, as we're moving into stage three, we hope things normalize a bit. I would say we have a report back, perhaps a September council meeting. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Did you want to make the motion to receive uh, the report, Councillor? Okay. Moved by Councillor Lococo. Uh, looking for a second by Councillor Cario that we receive the report. All those in favor? Okay. That's approved. Thank you. Um, item 9.6, Queen Street Road Closure. Uh, we've received a petition. The recommendation is for uh, information of council. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I would move uh, the recommendation from the BIA. Uh, what's the recommendation? Yeah, what's I can't hear Councillor Thompson. He, is your mic on, Councillor Thompson? No. No. Okay. It, it wasn't okay. They didn't hear what you said on. Uh, uh, I move the. BIA recommendation. So, so what is the recommendation? Um, yeah, Your Worship, I think that came in an email, not on our agenda notes, oh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it came as an email. Okay, so what is it? Um, That's what I'm asking. Uh, I read it, but <laughs> so did I, and I thought <laughs> I thought it was reasonable compromise as a result of the uh, complaints. Does, would anybody have that, uh, that, Mr. Clerk? So an email did come in this morning from the executive director of the downtown BIA uh, asking that uh, the request to close off two blocks of Queen Street to vehicle yeah. traffic mm -hmm. in an effort to stimulate the economy uh, or economic activity. Uh, specifically, the compromise that they're proposing is the opening of Queen Street from Buckley Avenue to St. Lawrence Avenue and continued closure of Queen Street from St. Lawrence to Chrysler. Yes, that's the record. Okay, okay. Yeah. motion. Uh, that motion by Councillor uh, Thompson, second by Councillor Strange. Any discussion to that? Uh, count, yeah, Councillor Coco. Mr. Mayor, conflict. Conflict, yes. Councillor uh, Peter Angelo. Yeah, sorry, Your Worship. Um, I found it here now. So it, the motion is to approve the compromise. Yeah, he just read compromise. it. He just read it. Okay. Um, all right. So it's different than what is closed right now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there, Councillor Dabrowski. Is there a timeline? Or is it to be closed 24 hours a day, or is there a specific timeline that they want to keep the street open? No, I don't have to. Just open up. 
Oh, no, no, which part? But the close. So you asked about the opening the part one, or the closing part? The one block. One section to be open, but the, the closed part, is it closed indefinitely for 24 hours a day, or are they asking for a timeline like Center Street? No. 24 hours? 24 hours? Okay. Pardon me? Okay. Yeah, it's closed all the time, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Just move Thanks. it up a block. So, you know, see how that goes, I guess. Yeah. All right, then. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Um, Minister Clark uh, sent us a letter regarding economic uh, recovery. A motion, uh, looking for a motion to receive. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? It's approved. Um, we've got uh, some letters from um, residents regarding the wearing of masks. Mr. Mayor, can I speak to that? Okay, well, I just had a motion by Councillor. Yes, we, you can. Uh, we got a motion as well, but go ahead. Thank you. Um, based on the comments of the earlier discussion, and I said I would bring it up under new business, and then I thought there's probably a better way for me to do that than take up everybody's time at the end for new business. So based on Councillor Cario's motion to leave the mandatory mass decision to the region and the next meeting if the region doesn't approve it, I'd like to make a motion that we as a council go on record with our position so that the mayor can take our appropriate position of our council to the region. And I liked the comments that he said that, you know, everybody around the table wants to see masking, but it's not our responsibility, it's the region's. So I came up with this, this um, motion. Whereas the Niagara Regional Council will consider a mandatory face covering bylaw at their meeting of July 23rd, and whereas if the regional council approves a mandatory face covering by law, it will be applicable to the city of Niagara Falls. And whereas it therefore be advisable that the Niagara Falls city council take a position related to a mandatory face covering and forward that position for the region's deliberations. Therefore it be resolved that the Niagara Falls city council members be polled at this meeting of their position for or against a mandatory face covering by law. And I so move that. Do we have a second to that motion? Okay, motion uh, and seconded by uh, Councilor Lococo. Now we had already had originally a motion. And I'd like, and Mr. Mayor, I'd like that recorded, please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Councilor Peter. Your Worship, is the motion to approve in principle? Is that? No. No, the motion is to send our position to the region. So if if the position is what Vincent said, you know, the region's going to take that. And actually, I think the mayor also said. Um, in a newspaper article, I think it was early July, that at some point the region's going to make this decision and it doesn't hurt for council, council's input to be involved in the regional decision. I think that this, a motion from council supporting mandatory masking by the region is appropriate. Oh, supporting, okay, yep, got it. Okay. Do we have questions or comments of council? So. Sorry. Yeah, Councillor. Yeah. Uh, so, our, our, is what we're saying. So, if if we do this, um, and because we don't have enough information as far as like what bylaw would be put in place, would they be like mandatory or voluntarily, or is there a, something that if if you didn't wear a mask, would there be a fine, or is it something more the in the kinds of the region? Yeah, but okay. we, we haven't seen the bylaw yet, the bylaw. so we don't know what, what are you approving? Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the comments earlier in this meeting was that, and I think you said it yourself, Mr. Mayor, that you believe that it's going to be supported. Um, the comments around the table were, it's redundant if we do it, if the region does it. But I, the comment by a number of people were, you know, nobody around this table is really opposed to masking. It is just that we're going to let the region do it. So I think that's a great alternative to what it was that Council Lococo and I were looking for today and tell the region we support mandatory masking from their council. So could you repeat your motion then? Is it a resolution? Yeah. It, it's how I wrote it. So I'm moving it as... So, a resolution of support of the regional council. So whereas Niagara Regional Council will consider a mandatory face covering bylaw at their meeting of July 23rd, and whereas if the regional council approves the mandatory face covering bylaw, it will be applicable to the city of Niagara Falls. 
and whereas it is therefore advisable for the Niagara Falls City Council to take a position related to a mandatory face covering and forward that position for the region's deliberations. Therefore, it be resolved that Niagara Falls City Council members be hold at, the, at this meeting of their position for against a mandatory face covering bylaw. And quite frankly, I worded it like that because of your comments in the paper, Mr. Mayor, that there's nothing wrong with the city weighing in with their opinion on what will likely be a regional vote. Okay, so do we have any questions or comments of council? Councillor Carrio? Well, the only question I would have is, in order for me to support the regional bylaw, I would really like to know exactly what the regional bylaw is. I don't really know all of the details on the regional bylaw. I don't know them, unless you can enlighten us. Well, we don't, we don't have it yet. It hasn't <laughs> been given to us yet. So we would be supporting a bylaw that we really don't know what's included that that's kind of a, I mean, that's, I have a little bit of a problem with that. I, I'm absolutely in support of my motion because it gives us the opportunity to have staff bring us something that we would be informed on before we debated it and made a decision. Uh, and Councillor Iannone's motion is asking me to support a motion which you're suggesting that we don't know what it's gonna include yet or what it's not gonna well, include. Actually, I, I, yeah, I'm, well, I, I'm sorry, I I'm not trying to be out. I'm not trying to be I'm difficult. Sorry, this is confusing. Um, actually, I, I don't think it's uninformed. And I, I watched that whole meeting, Count Mr. Mayor, and all the information was put on a table. I think it was deferred because they wanted a little bit more information. But the, it was pretty much crafted how it would be through that whole Zoom meeting and what, and what it would entail and who it would exclude and and i think when i watched st Catharines last night they also used a basis of what is coming back to the region so either we support it we support mandatory masking and it's not uh, which is, would have been the debate we'd have had had the motion not gone on earlier or we support the region supporting mandatory masking so so the, it, it, it's no there, so that everything's clear i want the, the motion is so around the table we see who supports mandatory masking and who doesn't. And I'd like to see the region debate it knowing that council supports it. There's been enough meetings. I mean, I think Nagrong Lake is gonna debate their bylaw tomorrow night. Um, they're not waiting for the region. So there's been enough information for council to assimilate to be able to support this motion, if, if, if they so will. Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, personally, I don't have a problem with the motion. I think the motion is just simply asking us what our intent is. So I'm happy to support the motion. Okay, any other discussion or debate of anyone else? So did you call for a recorded vote? Is that what you said, Councillor? Yes, I did. Okay. Okay, I think we've all heard uh, the motion and uh, uh, Councillor Anoni, I kindly ask that you maybe just forward that to me, just so that we've got the the wording exact for the minutes. Uh, I'll email it to you. Thank I'll you. I'll email it to you. So we'll have a recorded vote. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Opposed. Councillor Dabrowski. Opposed. Councillor Iannone. For. Councillor Kirio. Opposed. Councillor Lococo. For. Councillor Peter Angelo. Councillor Strange. Opposed. And Councillor Thompson. Opposed. And Mayor Diodati. Opposed. So that is defeated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can we get a motion to receive the comments regarding the masks? Moved by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Strange. Yes, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just wondering a question. We have three comments there. We've received many. Why those particular three and why not the other ones? I'm uh, just Ms. wondering. Maybe Mr. Clerk? Those are the three that were forwarded to myself. Like from the people, those people? Yes. Okay. We can forward to the other <laughs> Yeah. So did we vote on that? Uh, all those in favor? Okay, thank you. Uh, 9.9, .9, Niagara Falls Mental Health Committee, uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have a problem with the request, but I was just wondering, um, there's a lot of other grants 
recipients that received the Niagara Falls Cultural Development Grant, and I was wondering instead of just um, promoting one, maybe the city could promote all of them. And in the uh, the letter, but not in the motion part, it did say other finan maybe financial. I would be opposed to the financial because the city is giving the grant. Okay, so well, in, in there they ask for in-kind resources for online mental health resources and whatnot? Yes, that's part of the motion on the agenda, but if you go into the letter, it also talks about um, they would, if financial backing is something that the city of Niagara Falls would willing to con contribute, it's the last paragraph on the first page. So I'm just saying that we'll promote, but there's other Niagara Falls grant recipients that we should promote everyone. Right. And I'm not in favor of the financial part. So did you want to make a, because we're just, staff is suggesting we just re receive this? Sure. Um, I'll make a motion that the city support all of the Niagara Falls Cultural Development Grant recipients to promote them with in-kind resources for the promotion of all of the grant recipients. Yeah, good motion. Motion by Councillor Coco, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay. And that's approved, thank you. Uh, in camera, uh, there was no in camera, Mr. Uh, Clerk. Do we have any ratification? Uh, yes, this is from uh, the June 23rd in camera. So you'll see the report on the agenda, on the open agenda, Municipal Works 2020-14. This is the funding uh, commitments to Drummond Road, Portage, Gallanter Street that you'd mentioned in your opening comments. Now that the uh, the announcements have been made, this recommendation, or this report is now just listed on the open council for council's approval. Okay, uh, Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I would be happy to move the report, and I know that you uh, had mentioned in your opening remarks you you talked a little bit about uh, the project, and you did mention the fact that. It is going to have bike lanes. That was the one question that I had uh, in camera, was whether or not the design was going to have bike lanes. And I know that Mr. Nickel had got back to all of us, letting us know that it did. I, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to staff for including them. Um, it's so much easier to request bike lanes uh, from the region um, if we're putting them on, our, uh, on all of our major collectors. And it is of great importance to a lot of people to have those bike lanes. So any time that we're going through a reconstruction of any of our major roads, I mean, all we're doing is we're adding and making connections by putting in more and more bike lanes. So uh, kudos to staff, Your Worship. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, bylaws. I'm sorry, oh, we didn't vote? Oh, you made the motion. Uh, yeah, seconded, the motion. seconded by Councillor Campbell. We'll call the vote, all those in favor. Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Uh, bylaws, Councillor uh, Councilor Thompson, did you want to introduce the bylaws tonight? Oh, I can't believe it. You <laughs> Motion by Councillor Thompson, first time ever, to give the bylaws a first, second, and a third reading. Moved by Councillor uh, Thompson, second by Councillor Cario, completely not Councillor Peter Angelo out of the motion. I won't be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that is approved, thank you. New business. Uh, Councillor Cario. Uh, Your Worship, I received a phone call from a resident um, asking about speeding, and they were specifically asking me, they were watching the news, and they were um, they saw that Toronto has just recently put in photo radar. Yeah. Um, is, I can't remember in the, in the past if we've looked at photo radar or if we've asked about photo radar, um, but I think it might be a way to uh, curb speeding, in special, especially in um, school zones, residential areas. I don't know if we ever had it looked at or we asked a question, so I'm asking. Well, I can give you one part of the update that I do know, and then maybe I'll ask Mr. Bilodeau to help me out with the second part. I know at the region we approved uh, cameras for intersections for running red lights, and we also approved a motion for cameras on school buses for people that blow by the stop sign when they pop it out. Yep. So I know that's been approved uh, by the region already. And then, I don't know, Mr. Bilodeau, if you probably know a lot more than I do about this, yeah, so the Niagara region through their Vision Zero program is reviewing uh, automated speed enforcement. Uh, they will be leading it on behalf of all area municipalities and will include the area municipalities when the program is up and running. Uh, they're currently doing the slight selection for regional roads right now. We expect to hear more uh, shortly from the region on the next steps for that program. Perfect. Okay, that's great. Perfect. Thank you, yep. Thank you for that. Councillor Thompson and then uh, Lacoco. Thank you. Um, 
there's been a lot of emails and discussion uh, and comments about uh, Chippewa with their um, sewage and flooding of houses over the last little while, I think came about as a result of a, a project uh, in Chippewa uh, for two four-story apartments and uh, they're indicating that there's a serious problem there. I've talked to Mr. Nickel and uh, what I would like to have a report in the next uh, meeting with all of the work and effort that has been put in over the past 20 years for, uh, there was a serious problem in Chippewa with uh, flooding and uh, basement uh, problems. And uh, I think the work we've done over the past uh, many years and spent millions of dollars to uh, make sure that, and it came out in the report uh, map that he sent out, showed that, that this is really not a problem in the Chippewa area. I'd like to know the two huge storage tanks, how when they were put in, how much it cost the city. Uh, talk about the $100,000 a year that the, our is in our budget for um, sump pumps and backflow valves automatically done for anybody who in the city who has a flooding problem and the effort that has been concentrated on Chippewa with uh, um, any access into the sanitary sewer from eaves, sump pumps and uh, any other illegal uh, drainage going in there. Uh, I think we've done a great job and uh, the map shows you it's not a problem. So I would like to have a, a report from Mr. Nickel just to have that for uh, offsetting this problem that we've been hearing lately. And I so move. Okay, motion by Councilor Thompson. Seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo that we ask Mr. Nickel to come back with a report, comprehensive report on uh, flooding and anti-flooding measures that have been taken on in Chippewa over the last number of years, including the CSOs and the RAP program and everything else. Yeah. Uh, just before we call the vote, did you want to comment on that, Councillor? Yes, yeah. thank you, Mr. Mayor. That was going to be uh, one of my discussions as well. I attended the online meeting last week and one of the concerns from a lot of the residents were about the flooding. And I keep hearing from the residents, there's all of these problems, there's flooding, um, don't build anything until you fix our problems. So I thought, okay, well, how, how can I reconcile this with myself when I have uh, residents telling me that there's issues? So I thought we would talk to staff and staff provide us a lot of information. And to Councillor Thompson's point, yes, we have put a lot into Chippewa, but what I was looking for was more along the claims so we can see, and I know there's privacy issues, but I'd like to see the claims for the past 10 years in Chippewa for um, the sewer backups and the claims. And then another thing came to me recently when talking to another resident is that there's um, regional roads there as well. So it wouldn't just be an ask from the, for the city documentation, but some sort of report from the region as well so we can look at data to say, yes, this is the number. Is it two? Is it 2,000? I do understand that we've done a lot in that area, but I, I want some data to say yes, well, that I'm there's some claims. make a suggestion, Councillor, that unless uh, Councillor Thompson wants, considers this a friendly amendment to his motion, maybe we may make a separate I'll motion? I'll make a separate one, yes. I just wanted to bring it up as part of the discussion yep. as well. Okay, so did we, I'm sorry, did we call the vote yet? I, no, okay. Oh, Okay, seconded by uh, Councillor Campbell, or did we already, okay. oh yeah, we have Councillor uh, Peter Angel, that's right, you second, that's right. So if there's no discussion the Councillor Thompson motion, we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. You've got more, Councillor? I have one more, um, really shouldn't be here, but uh, I'm trying. Oh, your mic, is your mic on? <laughs> I was uh, approached by uh, a gentleman who had a problem and he wrote a letter to everybody, Mr. Hankey, 
regarding his problem uh, and I suggested to him to go to the <coughs> Chamber of Commerce. The, they look after business issues and he did and they didn't give him any answer or any support and uh, I would like, uh, I think uh, everybody got a copy of Mr. Madsen. Did you get it's a It's not copy? listed on the agenda, but I did email that no, to no, all of I council. No, no, I don't want it on the agenda. Yep. Yep. I j you got a copy. Yes, I do. I just want to Today? Uh, Today? ask you to find out. I always thought the Chamber of Commerce dealt with these issues. Could you uh, just uh, refer to the Chamber or any other uh, agency, regional or provincial or <coughs> local, to see if you give them some answers. Um, I, I believe, and speaking with Mr. Hankey uh, on a couple of occasions, he himself has already sent it to the Better Business Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Consumer Affairs, yes, Consumer but Affairs uh, but Wayne Gates' hasn't office. He has got any answer. No, he has not. Loki. Yep. So. Just see if you can sure thing. move it along. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I've got Councillor Lococo, then Councillor Strange. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I will um, reapproach the Chippewa. Again, going back to having some data to look at, I can't reconcile on how I need to respond when I have residents telling me one thing <coughs> and staff proving other, otherwise. So I would like to, in addition to Councillor Thompson's, to find out what we have done, and um, Mr. Nickel has been very kind to provide all of that information and the map. The map only goes to 2013. So I would like to put a motion forward that staff provide uh, claims information. It doesn't have to be people's names and addresses, but maybe a map of Chippewa, where the claims are. And then I guess the second part of it would be the same for the region because there's regional roads in Chippewa. No, I might want to just double check. Uh, yeah, Councilor Cario. I was going to just ask for legal yeah, opinion. Yeah, I'm just going to ask legal because I don't know what uh, uh, Mr. Lustig. I don't know. If, did you hear uh, that? Did you hear that motion? Yes, I did. Um, so, to the extent that any uh, personal information um, is um, being requested, uh, it wouldn't be appropriate, uh, and that includes the people themselves and their properties. It wouldn't be appropriate to provide that information. Uh, for two reasons. One is privacy, uh, and that's the, I guess, the main one. But secondly, um, we may be, the city may be potentially defendants in cases, claims, whatever, and uh, those cases may not yet be completely resolved. And um, we have an obligation not to prejudice our insurer's position because we subrogate our rights to our insurer. So it would be um, inappropriate to release information that was related to particular claims where there may be some impact on our insurer's ability to continue to defend us. So those are the restrictions. If just general information um, in the nature of like a total of how much in the way of claims we actually paid out, um, that's, that's okay, uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, I think once you start getting into maps, it gets a little bit, a bit dodgy as well because if people can put two and two together and say, well, this is where this is happening on this person's property, that person may not want that information to be made available. And so you get into the same sort of privacy issue. So you have to be careful and reasonable and fair. Thank you for that. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Lug M Lustig. Um, based on the privacy issues, could that be a report that could come to in camera that it's not public because it's specific uh, individuals? Um, and I would be happy with some sort of bulk number of, say it's um, $14 million, two properties or, or whatever. I just need some more data to make an informed decision about what is going on. And if anybody else has any other suggestions, I'd be happy to look at those as well. Okay, ask our CAO, Dwayne. Uh, just to follow up, I think what Mr. Lustig's saying is that if Mr. Nickel were to provide high level data that showed number of claims per year, maybe total volume of damage or something that did not tie it to a specific property, 
that's public information, that's fine. It's just when you start getting down to the detail of identifying properties, yeah. identifying individual claims, identifying uh, potential people, that's where it crosses the line. So a very high level statistical review year by year, that's certainly something Mr. Nickel could, could provide. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to clarify, Mr. Todd, would that be the whole city or just Chippewa? Well, uh, I think if you're asking just for Chippewa, I think Mr. Uh, Nickel would really appreciate that because <laughs> providing that for the whole city would cause a lot of work for him. So I'm going to say just Chippewa. How's that sound? I, I'm happy with just Chippewa, and then I'll look to see if, it, if, if I want to dig any further and if anyone else has any other suggestions about how to reconcile this because I would like to prove to the residents that we are working on it. Things have been done. Um, maybe it's not as bad as it's being stated, but I can't prove that. So I, I would just like some more data. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, just to finish up, I, I think, Councillor, and I, I hope all of Council, I think when Mr. Nickel provides this information, I think it's going to be, um, I think it, 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 it's going to show that the work is working, the amount of money that Council has put in over the number of years is working. I think it's going to dispel a lot of the issues that people may think exist. And I think the statistics will bode out that council has done a lot of great work in the last number of years out in the Chippewa area. Okay, thank you. I, I had one more do, do topic. You want to do the motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So yes, I, I would like to put a motion forward that um, a report come to council with a high level overview of claims and number of claims volume for specifically for Chippewa. A second. Okay, motion by Councillor Lococo, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. There's no discussion to that. We'll call the, has he got a hand up? You got to get a light on you there, uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Dabrowski, it's hard to see. Okay. I'm you... in favor. What's that? I'm just saying I was in favor. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. And I, w I did want to also add to that. A lot of people, you know, are under the mistaken idea that we don't support Chippewa. And the fact is, per capita, over the last several years, we spend more money in Chippewa than anywhere else in the city. So that's a complete fallacy. And the money we spent at the CSO at uh, Riverview Park and the L Low Lift Bridge, off the charts, and the 100000 like you said, that we spend for the RAP program, disconnecting weepers, and complete fallacy. At one time, yes, there was a problem. We've addressed it, we put money where our mouth is, and we've been dealing with it, and then now, you know, and I know, we, you know, we've got a sewer treatment plan, things like that we're working on. We've got other things. But anyway, I'm, you continue on. Thank you. Um, the last item I have is the Mayor's Back to Business Committee. Yeah. Um, I had a question from one of the unions. Had the unions been uh, consulted or um, not necessarily consulted, but uh, as a partner, as part of that plan? Absolutely, and I'll let the CAO answer that, absolutely. Well, uh, through Mr. Mayor, through the whole COVID process, we've had very, uh, um, very good relations, very good uh, conversations with, with our unions in terms of how we've been dealing with employee schedules, uh, their shifts or whatever. Uh, we've had employees that have actually participated in some of the uh, measures that we're putting in place, uh, whether that be um, you know, our, our bus drivers and our union, ATU union with the bus drivers actually participating and seeing how the protection for the drivers is, going out and testing it. Um, so there's been a lot of instances where um, the employees have been informed. Um, they've been informed of the measures we're taking in terms of say, City Hall with glass and, and protection measures. Uh, their managers are talking to them about those kind of things uh, as we reopen. So. Um, Every area is not the same uh, because if you take the Gale Center, uh, its procedures are much different than what city halls would be. Uh, so it's not a cookie cutter approach, but certainly the uh, management staff have been in, uh, keeping the employees informed of all of those measures and the safety measures that we've put in place. Okay, thank you. And my last, my last comment. At the last meeting, we talked about the mayor's back to business and was council on the mayor's back to business. And through you, Mr. Mayor, you said that it would be a direction from council if any council members were to be put on the committee. So I'd like to put a motion forward that if any council member would like to be on the mayor's back to business committee, that they be able to 
um, join, participate, and attend the meetings. I'll second that. Okay. Do we have any discussion to that motion? Now, I am going to speak to this because we've been working on our, our COVID committee with our EOC for the last several months. Uh, we've been work meeting weekends. We've been uh, regularly actively engaged. And like I said last time, counselors, if there's something you're unhappy about, then it makes sense. I can't understand why else you'd want to join at this point as we're almost into stage three, why someone's going to want to get involved. I'd be curious to know if there was rationale or reasoning for that. Yes, Councilor. I'd like to correct that. It's not the EOC, it's the mayor's back to business. But it's the same. It's the same group. Uh, it, it's people from EOC that are in the mayor's back to basic uh, uh, COVID recovery. It's the, the people are taken from there. So it's the same group. It's the same vetting process. So it's not new people. It's the same group that's been doing this the whole way through. Not, not necessarily the people, but the, from what I understood, the mayor's back to business would be taking us for number of months, if not years. I do you remember you saying that the mayor's back to business was months and years. So that's why I'm bringing this up. It's not a short term like the EOC was per the provincial state of emergency. This mayor back to business committee could be with us for nine months, two years, we don't know. So I, I would like to bring up the, the motion if we could vote on it, please. So can I ask a question? Is there something you're concerned about specifically? No, nothing that I'm concerned about specifically. I feel that council um, should be part of the decisions moving forward to move our city forward. And I think that that would be a good way. It's not a specific, it's a, a, a higher level having council involved. No, you understand council is involved because everything we do comes back to council, everything. So council is completely involved in the process. Involved in the sense that it comes back to us after the discussion and after the um, suggestions or recommendations are brought forward. I would like some council members to be on it at the time of discussion. Other than the mayor? Other than okay. the mayor, yes. In addition to the mayor, sorry, not other than, in addition to. In addition, okay. All right, so uh, any discussion to this? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Dabrowski? Yeah, uh, if I could chime in. I, I think you guys have been doing a, a great job. I don't have any concerns or complaints. I think adding another committee member, as you mentioned, this far into uh, our, our rebuilding stage would be pointless. And I think we're trying to micromanage the situation. I think the mayor has an open door policy and I'm confident that uh, if we have any questions or concerns, uh, we can call or, or email the mayor. So I, I can't support the motion. I, I think you guys have been doing a phenomenal job and I'm here if you guys need anything. Any other discussions, Councilor Kerr? Well, unfortunately, Your Worship, I can't support the motion either. I think it's a, it's a bit of a shot at the mayor and the people that are on the committee. I'm very happy with how the reporting's coming back to us. I can't support the motion. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, yes, Councilor. I feel the same way. Councilor Kerry, uh, I know. I, I don't think it's a bit of a shot at all. And I, I, I really think that comment was uncalled for. She She's put a motion on the floor. She's told you why. Um, nobody is criticizing what you're doing. We're criticizing, I think we were critical of the point we don't know who sits on that committee. But I think any, biz, any back to business committee is actually the council. Um, it, to me, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's not, re, it's not replacing you, it's not replacing staff. But I think anything that's done and created to move the city forward is what we're elected to do. I understand your EOC, that how your EOC formed, but the back to business is, as, as Councilor Coco said, you quoted, it could be the next two years. And I think that's what the nine of us are elected for. And I don't think it's out of line to ask to be part of it. And when people ask us why we're not part of it, we, our, our comment was we simply haven't asked. So now we're asking. And that's not a shot at anybody. Okay, is there any other comments before we call the vote? Okay, so we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and opposed? Okay, so that motion is defeated. Thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Strange, then, oh, to, is it to this Councillor? No, I've got Strange, Peter Angelo, and Campbell. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we're talking just about uh, stage three and the possibility of opening, and yesterday I was glued to the TV thinking the Premier was gonna actually open us up for stage three, and I found it kind of shocking that 
you know, the region of Ottawa is open up in stage three um, before us. They have double the population, um, they have triple confirmed cases, and they have quadruple deaths. And it just, I don't know what the formula they use uh, for that, and I can see, you know, ferries going along on the Rideau Canal and that while we got, you know, like the Hornblower has six people on it. They could fit 700, and they have six people on that, and they're just taking a beating. And you have ferries in Toronto that are at 30%. You have places of worship are at 30%, and then you have attractions. Um, and I don't know what, what, it, what it, if it's an attraction or a tour. They're saying that, and you might be able to fill me on this, if, if it's a tour, they're not allowed, or if it's a... No, they're allowed if they're a tour. But they're allowed if it's a tour. But no, they're not, not allowed if they're a tour, not allowed. but they are allowed if it's an attraction. And, and they, were they not voted the best attraction in all in Ontario? Ontario? They were. So it just, it just boggles my mind, and, and you know, people, you know, now you're going to get people going up to Ottawa, spending their money, and their tourism is going to be rocking while we're kind of sitting back in, in the shadows. And it, it's, it's really tough to see. Hopefully next week um, it will be different. But I would like to just make a motion and find out from Premier Ford you know, what is their formula? What is their data? What is their statistics do they use for passing on to each stage? Because it doesn't really make sense to me. I don't know what everybody else wants to fill in on this, but something like this with, with our tourism taking a beating and then they go and open a, a region that has way more uh, worse cases and worse deaths than we've had. So we've been doing a great job and, and we should be rewarded for it. So I'd like to just make that motion. Okay. Motion by Councillor uh, Strange, second by Councillor Thompson, that we ask for the, the metrics and the data on how they determine what area is open and, and what area is closed from the Premier's office. And we'll call the, that vote. All those in favor? Miss? Yes, Councillor? Mister, I just want to say it is really infuriating, isn't it, when you don't have all the information and you're not part of the decision making and they won't tell you why. I just, you. Find that, I just find that funny. Yeah. Funny. Okay, was there anything else, Councillor? <laughs> yeah, just the second one, and, and because of, of the recent, you know, with the closures of Center Street, closures of Queen Street, and talking about, you know, now that we want to maybe reopen it for a certain time, maybe it's time that we, we find out, and I don't know if we have it in, in our city or if we're even allowed to have it in our city, those little pillars that um, Ken Todd was talking about that they have in Europe. Because if we're going to continually do this, year after year, or we want to open it for temporary for two weeks, why don't we look into finding out the pricing of those pillars that just pop up at the end of each street and, you know, it could uh, alleviate some of the, I don't know if Matt Bilodeau knows any of the pricing and stuff like that, or maybe we can make a motion to find out and bring it back to uh, council. If you want to make that, the hydraulic bollards? Yeah, yeah that exactly, that would be great. Yeah, pillars, I'm not sure you're pillars your names there. Yeah. So, <laughs> motion by um, Councillor uh, Strange, second by Councillor Thompson, that we get some pricing on the hydraulic uh, bullards uh, for Niagara Falls potentially for next year for different areas or all yeah or or all you good with that or yeah, alternatives. For, for all streets yeah, yeah exactly yeah difficult in a frost yeah yeah or alternatives I know I was in Washington recently and I saw they had tons of things in place there right yeah. that they could lay down or just pop up um, so well that's the motion uh, all those in favor Okay, so uh, Mr. Billado, you heard that? Add that to your to-do list <laughs> right after you finish closing the street down. Good luck with that. That's, okay, next, uh, Councillor Strange, you're done now? I'm done. Sir. Councillor Peter Angelo, floor is yours. Then we got. Uh, thanks, Campbell. Your Worship. Yeah, I know that the uh, you know the situation in Chippewa has been brought up a couple times uh, by Councillor Thompson, Councillor Lococo, and uh, you know. Councillor Lococo in specific asked about a resolution to it. So I just wanted to talk a little bit ab about um, what my thoughts were. Um, I, w I was never able to bring this up earlier because the, uh, the EA had not really identified the location of the new South End Sewage Treatment Plant. But um, EA for those people watching it. Yeah. watching yeah, environmental the environmental assessment, assessment. Yeah. yeah exactly your worship um, but I know that way back when I, I initially floated the idea and uh, asked City Council to um, request that the region include uh, as part of their terms of reference and their new master plan you know the idea of a South End sewage treatment plan I said at that time that it was going to be a game changer uh, for Chippewa and um, perhaps now would be the appropriate time to you know, bring out, I guess, my mind thought on that because I never really had the chance to explain it in full. 
and that's because the location of the new plant had never been uh, established. Um, the new location of the South End Sewage Treatment Plant is going to be on the south side of the Welland River, uh, more affectionately called the Creek, um, you know, to those people that live in Chippewa. And with the location that it's going to be at, Your Worship, there is a, there's a confluence of all the sewage that, that meets at the corners of uh, Lions Creek and uh, Sodom Road. And then at that point there, the sewage goes underneath the creek and starts what I always refer to as the cogs in the wheel. What I would really like uh, our engineering staff to do the is logs to the cogs. Okay. determine, <laughs> yeah, 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 is to determine the, uh, the elevation at that point <coughs> As compared to, and, and I have spoken to the consultant who, um, who is, I guess, in charge of the design of the new plant, um, but I would like our engineering staff to verify that the elevation for the proposed intake basin is lower than the elevation that we get when we're at the corner of Lions Creek and Sodom Road. And my whole thought pattern there, Your Worship, is that uh, if we're at a higher elevation at the corner of Lions Creek and Sodom Road, and we're at a lower elevation at the intake of the new uh, sewage plant facility, then there's really no reason to send sewage underneath the creek and have it go from pumping station to pumping station to pumping station to force main before it finally flows by gravity to the sewage plant. It would be so much easier just to get the sewage to that point there. And then once it reaches that point, let gravity do the rest. And from a cost perspective point as well, Your Worship, it just makes the most sense in the world for the taxpayer to let gravity actually uh, send the sewage to the new treatment plant. So my motion would be twofold. Um, you know, the first part of it would be that engineering staff uh, confirm that uh, technically, um, the idea of sending sewage uh, instead of underneath the creek from the corner of Lions Creek and Sodom to the new sewage treatment plant is possible. And secondly, Your Worship, that if it is possible, that the city uh, look to, uh, I guess, make this change at some point in the future when the new plant is open. And I understand that we're probably six, seven years out from the new plant. But I think now would be the time to start preparing. I mean, we're going to need um, oversized pipes, uh, I guess, along the main road. Um, these are things that we typically would, uh, you know, put in our development charge bylaws. So I think staff need a good lead time in order to start planning the, uh, the change uh, in, in, in how the sewage flows out of Chippewa. So, um, I, I, it's the next step. It's what I always envisioned, actually. Um, I just, I, I couldn't bring the idea b forward before because the location of the new treatment plant hadn't been, uh, hadn't been finalized. But now that it's finalized, Your Worship, I think it's time that we, uh, you know, that, that we look at that as a viable option, and, and that would be my motion. Okay, so motion by Councilor Peter Angelo. Seconded by Councillor Strange. Oh, you want to talk to Yeah, him? I just talked to him. And, and you know what? He is, he's been talking with us for years, and, and he's got a passion for uh, poop, sewage. I don't know. But, <laughs> but it's, it's been something that, you know, Chippewa, we hear it all the time. And it's something like this that is, is a huge game changer, and it'll alleviate a lot of the problems in Chipp Chippewa and, and sewage being backflowed into their basements and stuff like that. And, it, and it'll be a game changer. And, and uh, if we, Get this passed and it happens it's going to be kudos to all council so i'll make this we'll second the motion okay if there's uh, any discussion to that motion if not we'll call the vote all those in favor okay and both parts of that motion are passed yes Councilor Peter Angel. yeah your worship just another short one um the I other one wasn't short but go ahead yeah. that yeah the first one wasn't short um uh okay you got me there um hamilton i believe is the only city in ontario that has a bylaw that regulates private cameras and uh, the reason I bring it up is because I heard from um, a couple in our city who they're filmed by their neighbor in their own backyard 
um, yeah, I know, as crazy as it sounds, yeah. right? So it's, a, it's someone's private camera that is pointed at their property. And Hamilton is the only one that has a bylaw that regulates where you're allowed to film. And basically it's on your own property. Um, so I just wanted to pass it on to staff. I mean, I'm not gonna make a motion that we approve Hamilton's bylaw. I, I'd rather staff have a look at it. But I think it's something that we should uh, think about, especially in today's day and age. Um, so I'll make the motion, Your Worship. It, it, it's called the fortification bylaw. I know I've already sent it to you. I've already sent it to Gerald Spencer, uh, our manager of bylaw services. So um, perhaps staff can have a look at it and bring back something that we can fit into Niagara Falls. Okay, so motion by uh, Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor sure. Campbell that uh, staff have a look at the Hamilton <coughs> fortification bylaw and how there may be something applicable for us in Niagara Falls. Okay, well, if there's no discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I was driving around out uh, uh, Dettenbeck Road area. Heck of a lot of construction going on out there. And I understand that there is no running water. Most of the uh, homes out there depend on delivery of water services. And apparently, with all the construction going on, there is now an hour lineup at the water station. And apparently, there's only one spout that they can fill up with. Is it possible <clears throat> To, for engineering to have a look at that, consider putting another uh, spout in there because some of the uh, uh, residents were complaining that they, they, they can't judge how much water they need and sometimes uh, that there's not enough water. It, it, just, it was being a really ugly situation and it was suggested that maybe one of these spouts can be put in just for water delivery to the homes. Okay, so. We've got a, a report coming back on spending money on that. Is that the one on uh, Pine Street Road? The spot? That we talked about? Is that in standard? Yeah. Uh, we've approved that. It's $150,000 to approve that. Well, do you want to get an update from uh, Mr. Nickel? Do you oh, have uh, some information on us, uh, for us, regarding the uh, water uh, station? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, and, and I apologize, I didn't hear Councilor Cario's comments, but um, you know we do have our Can water haulage up? station. Um, it is uh, it is active, very active, as was noted, but uh, there certainly are opportunities for private water haulers to buy water from that station. Every time I've been by it, there's um, there's only a lineup of possibly one. So um, we would encourage any private water haulers to contact us if they're having troubles accessing. Our, uh, our bulk water station, um, but I'm not aware of any issues with, um, with lineups out the, uh, on the street. Um, to add a, a second type of spout would not be feasible based on the configuration of the station, um, because all of those, the water that goes in is metered, uh, and there's a capacity issue if we were to try to do two trucks at once. So um, we would prefer uh, an approach where we look a bit long-term and, and provide a new bulk college station um, be more appropriately located closer to the south end of town at a later date. And then, Councillor, Car yeah, Councillor Carrier. Yeah, um, didn't we approve um, the money already for that, Mr. Nickel? Didn't we approve money for improving that station? I don't have, uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have the uh, the details with that. It could have been before my time here at the city. Uh, I was aware that uh, there was plans for a new station in the Chippewa Creek area. I'll have to circle back with staff to see the status of that right now. Yeah, because I think we approved money because there's room there for, I, I don't know if you know it or not, but there's two ways to fill your truck. There's a high fill and there's a low fill. So um, I think we had talked about it before about putting the low fill and the high fill in two separate driveways so that they could be filled at the same time. And, and many times there's a long line up there. And uh, a lot of times, when you call for water, they'll tell you, well, we don't know how long it's going to take to get water because we don't know how busy the, the fill station. And sometimes the water fillers go to 
Stevensville to fill because they can't get at ours. Hmm. So, so, yeah, go ahead, uh, Mr. Nickel. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the, the feedback this afternoon. I'll circle back with staff. I wasn't aware personally of some of those comments, and I'd be happy to follow up with an email to Council of, uh, of what I found and some options we have to improve the services. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, why don't we, so make it official uh, uh, from Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Cario, that we just ask for this update report. Uh, um, if you could, uh, Mr. Nickel. So all, moved. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, any other new business? A motion to adjourn. Okay, motion to adjourn by Councillor Dabrowski, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody.